Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, hello, I'm Claire McRae, the City Archaeologist here at City of York Council, and I just want to say um, a big uh, well, thanks for coming, for starters, and, and welcome to West Officers, if you haven't been here before, and welcome to everybody watching at home online as well. Um, welcome to the City of York Council and York Archaeological Forum Annual Archaeological Conference. Um, <clears throat> it's great to be able to hold this event in person once again after a cancellation due to COVID in 2020 and an online-only event uh, held on Zoom last year. The 2021 online conference attracted worldwide interest, so this year we're having trying out another first by live streaming um, the talks today and, and having them available to watch today and in the future on YouTube. So the audience at home will only be able to hear the speakers and see the presentations on the screen, so don't worry audience, you're not going to be on um, TV. Um, but the past year has been another busy one for archaeological investigation in the city. And um, to pick a few highlights, uh, we had the Guild Hall, which featured in last year's conference. Um, that's now moved into post excavation um, stage with and publication. Um, we've had investigations into uh, Roman deposits in the Micklegate area through various schemes and larger excavations at Boroughbridge Road, York Central and Fishergate. And we're going to hear about a couple of those today. So this morning, uh, we're starting with York Archaeology, talking about two recent sites on Boroughbridge Road and um, in Dringhouses, followed by Paula Ware from Malton Archaeological Practice, talking about an assortment of York sites, and uh, then York Central um, with Toby Kendall, Toby Kendall talking about this, this summer's excavation, um, which was carried out by on-site archaeology at York Central. And then we'll have time for questions for all of those speakers. Um, so if you can just hang on to your questions until, until the end of those talks, and then we'll, we'll deal with them in a batch. So during lunch, you'll be able to browse the book stalls downstairs again and engage with um, Yorkshire Museum Trust um, interactive exhibits, which will be in this room, uh, the, the Rydale Horde interactive exhibit. And there will be a carousel of slides shown on the screen for those at home um, over the lunchtime period. Um, then we're gonna restart at uh, 10 to two prompt. So make sure you've got time to sign back in downstairs. Um, before Martin Millett of the University of Cambridge discusses his ongoing project um, on Roman York beneath the streets. That will run neatly into uh, York Archaeology and AOC talking about the City of York deposit model project, which also has a, a crossover with Martin's project. There'll be time for further questions and a short break uh, before we finish the afternoon off with Stephen Gandolfi from City of York Council, who's the City Walls Manager. And um, Mark Douglas from English Heritage um, talking about the recently completed conservation project at Clifford's Tower. So we've got an awful lot to get through this morning. So uh, no more talking from me. I'm going to pass over to York Archaeology. Um, we've got Paul Flintoff giving a, an introduction, um, Marina and Paul with their presentations. So I'll, I'll pass over. Good morning, everybody. First speaker of the day. So no pressure. Uh, I'm just hijacking this presentation to introduce myself. My name is Paul Flintoff, and I'm the new regional manager at the York Archaeological Trust, taking another from Ian Milstead. I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, we've got quite a lot on in the city at the moment, most prominently a site of Fishergate and Micklegate. So if anybody would like to collar me during the coffee break or lunch, feel free to come and rattle my cage, because I can talk about it all day if I have to. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about it now. I'm going to hand over to one of our rising stars at York Archaeology, Marina, who's going to talk about Regency Muse during houses. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marina, and today I'll be talking about our excavations at Regency Muse and the changes in land use throughout the second to third centuries in the southwest of Ibaraco. So we're gonna start with a brief, um, a brief talk about the location and the landscape of our site. And then we'll have a look at some evidence from early investigations in the area. 
then see our research opportunities, and last but not least, our results. So our site is uh, located at a former residential property that was demolished recently for a new care housing development uh, by Abbeyfield Society in York. And Regency is approximately four kilometers um, southwest of the center of Iporaku and about 91 meters southwest of the estimated line of Roman Road 10. So some of the previous investigations in the surrounding areas of our site are in, there was one in 1994, prior to the construction of the Abbeyfield's house. And they, were, they mainly found Roman boundary ditches and gullies. Then in 1997, we had some excavations for the Fox Public House that again revealed some more Roman boundary ditches and a burial. And then in 2003, uh, the starting gate, a major excavation at the starting gate site, which revealed some more burials, the remains of Roman structures and buildings, and then some more agricultural activity. So here we use the map from Patrick Ottaway's uh, book, Archaeology in the Environs of Roman York, and it shows us, um, I don't know if how to point. Okay, thank you. So it shows us um, where the previous excavations are located in, relations, in relation to our site, which our site is basically that blank space in between number six, which that would be the 1994 excavations. And then uh, here will be the starting gate excavations. So we have that space that we have, we investigated. So we expected to find similar finds from those, those previous sites. So before we started our site, we, we had these three questions uh, as a guidance, basically, to, to help us um yeah to help us look for specific things and not just go vaguely onto site so we wanted to see how did rural settlements contribute to the local economy and facilitate the supply of the military and if if we could identify a shift from pastoral activity to arable uh, practices also we want to see how boundaries and field systems change over time and how did rural settlements uh, in this part of York relate to each other? So our results from the investigations was a series of ditches in grid pattern alignment. And they were aligned mainly northeast to uh, northeast southwest and then northwest to southeast. And they're all Roman in date. So this suggests that there was a focus on the improvement and management of agricultural land, including drainage and land division across the whole site. And we think that the stratigraphically, the ditches running from um, uh, southeast to northwest are probably earlier. And also the, um, the Romano British pottery found indicates intensive human activity during the first to second centuries, and then probably less in the third to the fourth centuries. So a very exciting feature we found was a Roman cask lined well, which is a rare, a rare find. And with only a few examples uh, in York, we did, uh, it wasn't really something we expected to find because it was directly underneath um, uh, a line of pit. And then we excavated that pit and we found at the bottom of that, we started seeing the lining of the wood. So we had to, we had to excavate all of it out because the pile would have gone through for the new development there. Also at the bottom fill of the well, we had a very exciting find, which is a copper alloy coin dating the 85 AD, which is depicting um, the Roman Emperor um, Domitian. So we don't know exactly if the coin was lost or it was purposefully placed into the well, into the well's lower field, but the excellent condition of the coin could indicate that 
uh, it was deposited there while it was relatively new. And it's also, it's nice to think that someone back then might have just done this as, um, have done this hoping that it would bring some positive outcome in their lives. Now moving on to our polling analysis. So our polling and environmental analysis from the Wales fields shows mostly uh, older and Dandelion present. And um, we have minimal appearance of cereal crops that could suggest that there's there could be a nearby crop growth, but not, not actually on our site. That means our, our site is probably used uh, for pastoral activities. Hence the presence of, presence of the well as a water source for the livestock. So a further analysis of the findings of this site um, and a comparison with other similar sites uh, would assist to a better understanding on how uh, the land was managed and to provide a more accurate chronology of events. So we know that our results from our site coincide with the previous investigations over the, that occurred over the last 30 years in the drink houses area. We have managed to answer, have we managed to answer these three questions? I would say yes and no, because we, there are more questions created that could only be answered with uh, further analysis and future work. Uh, also, I wanted to add that on this side, we didn't actually see the shift from pastoral to arable farming due to the minimal appearance of crops, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, that was shown in the pollen analysis. But despite that, we like to think that the past pasture use on, our, on this land would have still contributed into the economic growth of Roman York. It was difficult to tell the exact dates of our features due to the erosion and the disturbance uh, and the constant recut. Nevertheless, this shows um, that these grid pattern linears, uh, this can tell us that the land man management continued started from the first centuries and continued throughout the rest of them until the late third century. And yeah, even though there's still we're still in early stages on this project, with further and further analysis and publication, we'll be able to compare local sites and understand the relationships between them. I would like to thank um, our city archaeologist Claire our client Abbeyfield Society and our main contract of history and also our site team because without them we wouldn't manage to find all these nice finds. Thank you. And I will pass to Nicole. Yeah. <laughs> Morning, everybody. Um, I'm Paul Howlett. I uh, work with York Archaeology. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Burbridge Road excavations and investigations. Um, but before we get into the detail, I'd like to just tell you the, the sort of question that a site like this might sort of contribute towards. We'll look at a quick look at location and landscape, and then um, the evidence from earlier investigations that has prompted the the deeper investigation across a, a number of areas. It's jumping ahead here. Um, okay, so sort of research question that a site like Burbridge Road might sort of um, help us to understand is, you know, how did late Iron Age settlements, um, land use and traditions develop and change outside of the center of York um, during and after, and after the Roman period? Um, so I suppose we could look at the agriculture, the development of field systems, um, rural settlement, any economic relationships that we might glean, and burial practices and funerary tradition. Any sort of changing patterns in, in the landscape and chronology across those areas might sort of help our understanding. Um, so location. Uh, 
we're just north of the A59 on the north west of um, York. Uh, the site was formerly a sports ground um, and is currently under development by Miller Homes. It's a fairly level site. Um, natural was glacial sands, gravels and clays. Lots of sand, I can assure you. Um, two and a half kilometres northwest of the Roman centre of Ibarakum, um, at about 800 metres northeast of the projected line of the Roman road. Since we've jumped ahead there, we're missing. <coughs> you just excuse me a minute. It... Yeah, we're missing a slide. Um, so essentially, we're on the western hinterland of Roman York. Uh, historically, it's been agricultural land. Uh, earlier investigations by Onsite Archaeology Limited in 2014, 2015, um, initially a geophysical survey, um, there were lots of anomalies, um, probably derived from the demolition of the sports ground area and underlying fencing. Um, a further geotechnical um, set of trial pits didn't reveal much more evidence. As you can see from the picture, the uh, subsequent evaluation by on-site um, was across the whole area, um, targeting those anomalies. Um, the result was that uh, there was fairly frequent unabraded um, Romano-British pottery, some ditches, and to the north, um, a prehistoric uh, pit of cremation um, and the usual ridge and furrow that's cutting through. Um, so these are our areas that we investigated. Uh, we've got, I beg your pardon, something's, yeah. These are our areas that we're investigating. Area A at the top, a little small, 10 meter by 10 meter. And then further down, we've got B, C, and D, and a further three, three trenches. And we'll, we'll just go into a little bit more detail of what we see there. Um, that's, a, that's an overview of the archaeology that uh, was spread across the site. Area A, um, rationale for area... Well, this is going astray. Rationale for area A... Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I'll use that. Um, rationale for area A was to look in the general area of the pit and cremation that was found in the 2015 evaluation. Uh, we didn't find anything um, just for us. Um, and the pottery, there was no Romano-British pottery, just some 13th century and post-medieval stuff. Um, however, different picture when we go to area B, um, the very first feature that we found was a cremation, um, in the western side of the site. Um, I'm calling it prehistoric. We haven't actually got a, a real date for it, but it, it uh, looks very similar to um, the one from on site. It was um, fairly shallow. There was no urn um, and there was only 37 grams of cremains, although they were diagnostically adult. So uh, a token cremation. Um, the green ditch in the central area, um, fairly shallow. It may very well be the earliest ditch on, on the site. Um, there was no pottery in it, just a few residual flints. But as you can see, there's a, a developed sort of field system happening. We've got the pink east-west linear there towards the south. That had first century and some Iron Age pottery in. Um, the yellow enclosures, um, first to second, and the blue ditches, um, second to third. So there does seem to be a progression and the development of the field system, possibly a corner enclosure in yellow at the top there. Um, to the north of the, uh, of the green ditch there, you can see we have another cremation. Uh, this time it was earned. It, uh, to the pottery, probably Iron Age Romano British at the moment. We, we haven't really focused in on onto that. Um, the only other features 
of significance in area B were um, features that looked really very much like burials. Um, a point to note here is that bone preservation on the site was ne negligible. Um, very, very little. It was a little bit in the, in the subsoil, but the only bone that we really saw on the site, and that's across all, of it, all the areas, um, was any anything that was burned. Um, the top two features, uh, nothing in them at all. Um, they're all aligned in the same direction. Um, they look suspiciously like burials. Um, the bottom one, um, we did actually retrieve um, an unerupted infant premolar from there. And there were some um, animal bones at the uh, within the fill, um, probably uh, pig, I think. So um, it could be that we have some sort of votive material in there. There was a small piece of Roman pottery in. Um, moving on to area C, um, we thought we'd pretty much get the same sort of thing, but this is when we uh, had the this, this surprise of all of this stuff going on. There's, there's a lot there. Um, so you're seeing, um, we've got Roman um, Iron Age ring structure, the different phases of that, that's the obvious bullseye in the middle there. Um, outside of that, we have um, more token cremations and we have pits um, with lots of fire crack, cracked stone in and some of them um, cutting through um, earlier cremations. Um, let's see if I can get this point to work in. Yeah. So here, uh, we had a couple of cremations in there, um, but it cut by uh, a pit which was full of the firecrack stone. Um, so that's an overview of Area C. We'll just focus in a little bit on that. Um, didn't really get anything uh, markedly prehistoric. We had a nice oblique late Neolithic arrowhead just from the from the subsoil. Um, the uh, ring structure in the middle, we've got a triple sort of enclosure around it. And the, this seemed to be, um, from the pottery that we've retrieved, um, there seemed to be a progression outwards in date um, with the blue ditches, uh, having third to fourth, second to third century uh, pottery within them. And in fact, the, in the uh, top right there, you can see um, those ditches do appear to be recut a number of, in a number of occasions. Um, the stone capped pits, um, at first when we sort of exposed those, we thought maybe they're just remains of foundations, but there are pits underneath the, that stone capping almost like the cairns um, and within those pits lots of burnt material lots of pottery fairly fresh pottery um, and just to the side there we had a little sand filled uh, gully ditch um, and we had we picked up almost a complete um, third century pot in there and some glass uh, nothing else in the rest of rest of the ditch it was really right at the terminus um possibly associated with with um the pits the material in the pits dated from first to second all the way through to third to fourth um century uh, a bit more detail on the ring structure um it seemed to be formed over a number of phases really we've got an inner ring gully there in brown um very shallow no more than 20 centimeters, um, and that inner ring gully encloses pits. And you can see in red there, there is a um, cremation there. Uh, some of the other pits are full of what looked, what appeared to be cremated uh, or burnt material. Um, I think we need a bit more further analysis on those. The fragments are very, very small um, and um, I could not be. Um, sort of diagnosed to any sort of uh, gender or, or age. Um, we have postals as well. Um, it's difficult to actually say that we've got any any sort of alignment. Um, however, yes. 
the outer um, crescent shaped um, feature quite different, um, jam packed full of firecrack stone. It's the same firecrack stone we see in the stone filled pits to the north and south of the Ringley. Um, and that northern crescent shape, where the term terminus is, was round about 75 centimeters deep. So really quite deep, almost like a palisade type um, gully. Uh, it's interesting to see, although it looks as though it's a, obviously a later phase, it is respecting um, the opening of the earlier gully. Um, and the enclosure ditch just immediately um, surrounding the ring structure does have areas where we've got dumps of this firecrack stone in the top of the fill. So although that ditch there is first to second century um, material below that firecrack stone, within that firecrack stone we've got possibly Iron Age material. So uh, it looks like we we might be able to sort of pin some sort of um, sequence on that ring structure. Um, certainly the, the outer crescent shaped things are, um, are later. I think I'm a little bit too heavy handed here. So if you just forgive me. Um, so if we go on to area D, the earliest features um, I think we can see in here, we, we have another pit that looks as though it's possibly prehistoric. And then just to the right there, we have, uh, we're picking up some late Neolithic Bronze Age tools. I think that one's um, been burnt. Uh, and that's interesting because the larger pit, uh, which is uh, indicated there, which has a smaller pit cutting into it, uh, was quite distinct, very, very gray, almost looked like charred sand, but tiny, tiny, tiny fragments of um, cremated uh, burnt bone and um, little teeny fragments of charcoal, but um, and the odd fire, fire cracked stone, but nothing else. Um, it'd be interesting to see what the um, analysis of that comes out at. This this laptop is really sensitive. <laughs> um, so as well as those features, um, I think the obvious thing that we've got there is we've got a north-south ditch. Now I haven't attempted to phase that yet because we don't have the, the data, um, but relationship wise, it is later um, than the outer enclosure ditch from area C. Um, and it is parceling up the land somewhat. Um, at the bottom there, you see, we've got a quite a wide east-west ditch, which, ha which has been recut a number of times. Um, and that seems to be enclosing an area where we've got beam slots, fence lines, posts and stake holes, um, some of them in situ um, and some of them possibly remnants of uh, a structure that has been left lying on the ground. So that looks like it's something that's been left lying on the ground. But in here, we have it actually in situ and possibly a construction. Um, so I haven't attempted to make any, any sense of uh, that yet, but it does look as though there's some sort of um, structures going on there. Um, to the north of the site, uh, we've got really quite substantial post holes. Um, now these are obviously later. They're actually, um, I think, integral to a cobble platform um, that was over the top of the um, silted up north-south ditch. Um, we couldn't see any other post holes. We did look further to the east. Um, there was nothing present. The cobble platform is purely over the top of that ditch. Um, so initial thought was it's a causeway, it's just filling in some soft ground. Um, but then it begs the question, what are these large um, post holes for? Um, trenches one, two, and three. Um, rationale for those was we we've got we've got all of those um, 
not the focus of archaeology there with lots of pottery, lots of ditches, lots of activity. And we can see spur ditches coming off. They seem to be fizzling out a little bit as we go further south and east. And that's probably confirmed by trenches one, two, and three. We didn't get any Roman pottery in there at all. Um, they were empty of archaeology. So we seem to have the focus of activity further to the north. So back to our sort of questions, um, agriculture and land use. Uh, um, we have got evidence for development of field systems, We've got possible stock enclosures in Area D, and um, we do have what looks to be early settlement activity. We've got a ring gully there to the north that's been truncated by the north-south ditch and all of the activity to the south of Area D where the stock enclosures are. Um, So you know, it begs the question, does the enclosure of the ring st structure suggest the continuation of Iron Age or local traditions and settlement? Or are we sort of at the crux where we're seeing replacement of earlier traditions, earlier, earlier field systems with new ones? So interesting from that perspective. Um, regarding settlement activity, I think we've probably still got to ask the same question. Have we got some sort of Roman um, farmstead or something nearby, uh, and this is a an earlier Iron Age representation. We've got lots of roof tiles and floor, floor fragments and quern stones coming from the outer uh, enclosure ditches, and of course we've got the larger post holes from Area D. Um, so was the ring structure in Area C originally a roundhouse, um, or was there something else there earlier? How did it change over time? Um, What's interesting is that that entrance where there that you can see is about four meters wide. Um, I don't know whether that's usual for a roundhouse, but um, it's probably something that we sort of need to look at. Economically, um, I think if we looked at the assemblage that we're getting, um, we could compare it um, with other sites around York. Is it typical? Um, is there anything that we can sort of glean from that to suggest some sort of economic relationship? Um, this is the material that came out of that eastern ditch um, just adjacent to the pits. I'm not even touching that. Uh, so as you can see, uh, that's the only, pretty much the only glass that we found on site. So it's interesting that it's in that particular area where the pits are. It has been suggested that those pits might represent some sort of funerary activity. Um, this might be evidence of feasting. I don't think we can say that authoritatively. Regarding um, burial practices, I think this is where it becomes quite interesting. Um, we've got cremations right across the site, some of them isolated to the north. Um, we've got some of them outside of the ring gully, but within the enclosure, and we've got some within the ring gully itself. Um, what I found really, really interesting was the top left, top right there, we've got a, a, um, a pit with lots of stake holes in. Uh, it had um, burnt material in with burnt bone, um, but the stake holes, you could see at the bottom of the stake hole where the burnt bone had been pushed down to the bottom of the stake hole cut. Um, suggesting that or that the material was deposited and then it was marked. So possibly markers for um, cremations or, or some of the domestic activity. Um, at the bottom right there, we've got a cremation which was um, human, but the, the material coming out of there um, was very, very fragmentary. Um, but we have a stake all in there. Um, and we've got a few others like that. Um, so some of these pits have cremains of both human and animal. Um, so that, that's particularly interesting. Um, what was striking on site was we had these two stones in the terminals of the inner ring gully. Now the inner ring gully didn't have any stones in it. It was silted up, just fine silt all the way around. Um, a bit disturbed at the north end. But um, at the terminals, we had these two zones. Uh, 
appeared to be quite red. The one at the, the top there um, has lots of wear marks on it. Um, they may very well be stained red because we did find a hematite burnishing tool um, in the vicinity. Um, so are these ring structures uh, and pits focal points for Romana British Iron Age funerary activity? Um, where does all the stone come from? Um, almost 1,200 kilos of burnt stone. Is that domestic? Is it funerary or is it both? Um, there was no sign of any burnt natural within the middle of, of the ring, ring structure, so um, we don't know. So Burbridge Road, we've got Weatherby Roundabout um, nearby, similar sort of Iron Age Romana Bridge settlement. We need to look at these together and with other sites around the area to um, get a, a better feel for what's going on and perhaps compare them regionally and nationally. Um, and sort of get a, a better feel for what's going on around York and at this sort of transition time. Um, I'd like to thank you all for listening and being patient with this uh, rather precocious laptop. Um, and thanks for everybody on site. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul um, and Marina. Um, yeah, apologies for um, the technical glitches that we seem to be having. If that continues, we'll try and get that sorted out for later. Um, so I'd like to welcome up now Paul Aware from uh, MAP Ar Archaeological Practice, who's our next speaker. That's the point there. Good morning, everyone. It is sensitive, isn't it? Haven't even touched it. Yeah, let's see. Let's see what happens. Um, I'm Paul Aware from that, and um, I'm going to be talking about just a couple of sites. Originally, I was going to um, bring in Germany back, which would have been a quite useful parallel um, for what we've just heard about. But I realised time constraints and the importance of what's coming out from Marygate, it probably wasn't a good idea. So the first site that I'm actually going to show you is Bootham Crescent, the former York City football ground. Um, we were asked to do a desk-based assessment, um, geophysics and trial trenching. Um, and unfortunately it was all negative, but I thought I would bring it in today just because of the social history that's so important for York. Um, it was a um, pretty iconic building and a lot of the York residents were really upset when it went, but it was beyond its, its time span really. Um, and Kelly Hunter, my colleague, did a building survey which complements the work of Historic England. And it can now be, it's now on the ADS for anyone to have a look at. But I've just put a few of the shots in because when people heard that we were doing it, a lot of memories came out about people saying about this tunnel that went behind the back of the stand where people from one end had to go to the loose. Um, they mentioned that you can see the stands here. And um, other people mentioned the bus that they were they were very deep and they like playing there um, because of the, the bus that they could go into. And there's an old turnstile there and steps up. And unfortunately, we did um, nine trenches, but none of them had any archaeological deposits. And the reason why I'm mentioning it is I heard Christina talk on um, Wednesday and was really interested what she was saying about the deposit models. And this is really for the benefit of the deposit model. It's highly likely the reason why there are no archaeological deposits on this site is it is really clay, clay um, area. It was a it's definitely been marginal land. It's away from the sands and gravels. And a testament to how bad it was is that uh, over the short period that the football club had been there, there had been at least four interventions of laying drainage to obviously get the pitch into some kind of standard. So that's the reason why I've mentioned that one. Um, the rest of the work that we've been undertaking, um, apart from Germany Beck, has all been negative. Um, so we're building up a pattern, but I can't really mention those because they're not really coming through planning yet. So then on to Marygate, a oh, long story of Marygate. Yorvik House and view, uh, this is the view of um, Yorvik House where we were working at the back of it. We started in 2019, 
COVID came just as we were going into post excavation. The client said, because it was a hotel and they didn't have any guests, could we not do any work? And then they commissioned the post excavation and assessment this time last year. If I tell you that getting specialists at the moment has been a bit of a nightmare um, in terms of programming, but we are now at the, seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I've had a look at the uh, Roman pottery um, in consultation with Phil Mills, and Phil's going to look over it so we can now start to add more. So some of you may have heard some of the things that I'm going to talk about, but this is the update. So this is the site. Um, it's situated within the city of York along the western side of Marygate and positioned adjacent to the Museum Gardens, north of the River Roos and south of the principal A19 road, which heads northwest out of York. The area of excavation comprised the rear garden associated with Yorvik House, which is bordered by Marygate. To the east and south of Marygate, at the time of the excavation, the site was still in operation as a functioning hotel. The street front slopes from northeast to southwest from 16 metres to 7 metres AOD. The soils within York are generally boulder clay with bands of sands and gravels overlapping the solid geology of sandstone. The site lies within an important area of uh, 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 important archaeological area adjacent to the museum gardens. Within 20 metres of the possible Roman fortress annex and 200 metres from the multangular tower, which it formed the corner of the Roman legionary fortress. Roman Road 5 is presumed to have run through the southern end of the site. The medieval remains of St Mary's Abbey stand within the museum gardens and constructed in 1068. In its heyday, the abbey was one of the wealthiest Benedictine abbeys in England. A major rebuilding and expansion of the abbey occurred mid to late 13th century under Abbot Simon de Warwick. The Abbey was one of the last to surrender to the Crown in November 1539 and during the dissolution of the monasteries. From the 16th century onwards, the land was to use as gardens in private ownership of the King's Manor and acquired by the Yorkshire Philosophical Society in 1838. The Hospitium still stands in the gardens and the two-storey structure dating to the 14th century was built as a guest house for visitors to the Abbey. Just some views. The site of the excavation is marked by the red arrow. The line of the Roman fort is also marked by the intermittent red line. The, ed the medieval precinct of St Mary's Abbey in yellow and two further arrows indicate further areas of archaeological investigation that will be referred to within this paper. The white arrow locating the 1992 evaluation by York Archaeological Trust and the blue arrow, the most recent work by Onsite. I must qualify that these two sites are not the only archaeological work undertaken in Marygate, but provide additional evidence to supplement ideas. An archaeological evaluation undertaken by MAP in 2017 consisted of three trenches and revealed the following profile. The existing ground level is around 12.56 metres AOD, the top of the archaeological horizon occurring at 10.67, approximately 1.62 metres below the existing ground surface. We had very limited information, um, partly because we were doing it in such a small confined space, but trench one did reveal um, a, a, a Roman um, ditch and a little gully. And from that, the pottery assessed by Phil, he suggested it was of the urban military context, context that you would expect. And he said, you know, obviously the site's position to the potential um, fortress annex um, was one of the key questions that we would look at. In general, the post-Roman layers, which consisted of successive deposits of dark soil, contained a few sherds and a few sherds of post-medieval material and reflected the horticultural accumulation associated with the gardens of the original property of 50 to 52 Marygate. The large accumulation of deposits on top of the natural ground also suggested that the ground surface in this area may have been raised by dumping of soil and rubble. The successive raising of the ground may be due to the difference in levels between the street level at Marygate and the back garden area of the terrace where the original property was constructed. 
The only medieval activity was 15 sherds of residual pottery within the post medieval makeup layers. Either medieval features, which may be related to backyard activity, including rubbish dumps and pits, were closer to the main building itself or had been, been, been removed by post medieval activity. That is what we had thought would happen. Once the former hotel extension was demolished, excavation revealed a sequence of brick built water systems for household supply and no doubt irrigation of horticulture in the gardens, which had been inserted and truncated earlier deposits. These features were cut into the accumulated and perhaps dumping of garden soils associated with the present properties um, along Marygate. And this is one of the post medieval pits that you can see cut truncating earlier features. Sealed beneath the garden soils at the western end of the site, a distinct burnt area, detailed cleaning revealed a pottery kiln, which was initially assessed as being of 15th to 16th century date due to the nature of construction. The kiln structure consists of a central subcircular chamber, three meters in diameter, four flues leading off chamber, roughly equivalent to west, north, east, south, and the east, north, and west flues were oval and 1.5 meter long and 1.2 wide and 0.5 to 0.6 deep and were absolutely crammed with pottery. The south flue was longer at three meters, but with similar depth and width to the others. Was this the main stoke access hole to the chamber? The chamber had surviving walls of roughly and horizontally coarse brick or wall tile on the northeast, southeast, and southwest sides, with a maximum of five courses surviving at the southeast quadrant. You see that here. There was no surviving wall on the northwest side, perhaps due to robbing. Bricks were five by 12 and four centimeters in size and unbonded. Those here with all the pottery. There were no obvious kiln furniture, props, or bars. Very few products survived intact, and the large sherds tend to suggest vertical pressure. What was the reason for the abandonment of the kiln? Was it due to the collapse of the kiln itself? More ad hoc structures survived at the entrance to the north, east, and south flues. These were of unbonded tile at the north flue, a mixture of brick and limestone on the east flue, with more integrated limestone blocks on the southern flue. These structures presumably were remained, uh, remains of arches to control airflow into the chamber. The chamber and flues were backfilled with dumps of burnt clay, stone and pottery, with some deposits of charcoal also present on the base. Some of these dumps extended both into the chamber and flue, and there were signs of wear. As. The kiln structure, after the ceramics were removed, revealed the structure of the kiln, and there you can see it quite clearly. There is no evidence of any other related structures, including workshops or clay storage or drying areas, but if this is due to the restrictive nature of the site, further evidence for pottery production may survive in other gardens in the area. Let's see the kiln structure. The main vessels represented were plain globular jars with short rod handle and a pulled lip glazed in olive green over the short neck and upper part of the body. The pottery is all wheel thrown and fairly basic. Examples of the pottery assemblage, which are that there are 16,500 sherds in total um, from the kiln, a um, huge amount um, to, to have got washed. Um, and looked at. Um, and really, we, we're pretty certain now in terms of um, what's going on uh, with the pottery uh, from this area, unlike other parts of the site, which is to come. The unexpected survival and significance of this kiln in terms of medieval pottery studies cannot be overstated. It has the potential to change the focus for study and possibly accepted chronology. The kiln contained a mixture of vessels, some with bungholes, presumably pitchers and cisterns. The glazes consist of, of copper glaze and copperless lead glaze. And there's a single example yes, here, of a small, shallow rectangular tray with interior glaze likely to be a salt cellar. 
and the, the archaeometric data undertaken by the University of Bradford uh, was far earlier than anticipated. Um, as you can see, we've completely changed from that 15th, 16th century date to uh, 12th, 13th. Putting the life of the kiln largely in York ceramic period 10, but overlapping at the lower end with ceramic period 9 and the upper end at the start of the ceramic period 11. The oxidized red fired vessels with sandy fabric associated with the kiln would therefore appear to be early examples of the sandy redware of period 11. And the thin sectioning should confirm this exact parallel, but that will be at analysis stage. We still haven't got to completing the assessment report. The relatively high archaeomagnetic date suggests that the kiln is a precursor to known production and elsewhere in York at Warmgate and Fishergate. As Elsa, Maimon and Anjena have previously highlighted this possible development. The kiln would appear to be an early multi-fluid example conforming to Musty's type 3, a mainly Yorkshire and Midland form introduced in the 13th century. Interesting to note the proximity of the kiln to the Abbey precinct, Fishergate Kiln was on, on land connected to St Andrew's Priory, which might explain the relatively early use of tie in the industrial setting. It would be interesting to look at any documentary evidence to connect pottery manufacturing with St Mary's Abbey, and we're looking at, are we looking at emerging pottery techniques? So my colleague Mark Stevens has, has concentrated on that side of it. Now to the Roman deposits. The Roman deposits, the complex Roman deposits appeared at 10.64 metres AOD. The truncation of the deposits by later activity, including the insertion of the kiln, made interpretation difficult. The stratigraphic sequence of the Roman deposits is currently incorporating the assessments as they come in from various specialists, and they are rolling in now. Like previous archaeological sites on Marygate, burials were located. Up to six inhumations were revealed, including four neonates one truncated burial and one complete inhumation, which are assigned to phase five. The neonates appear to be contemporary with the Roman structures and will be discussed later. The phase five burials are orientated north-south and now have the benefit of specialist assessment and C14 dating. Given the small number of burials, it's impossible to suggest a designated burial site. And you can see this is uh, a male Sorry, this is the male here, this is the juvenile, and this is one of the neonates. Um, skeleton 505 um, is really significant in, in terms of dating the site um, because it actually this burial cuts um, the earlier Roman building. Um, it's placed in an earth cut grave and there's no evidence for a coffin. It's the truncated remains of a male adult that has been cut by a pit. Unfortunately, Luke had been removed. It's orientated north-south in an extended supine position and its right arm is across the body. It's a mature male, 46 plus, and its height at 164 centimetres, 5 foot 5 is below average height. And he had evidence of heel trauma, fractures to hand and wrist, and soft tissue trauma. And great, we've got a date. And you can see here, um, the earliest date is a mid third to latest um, mid sixth. Well, first, first third of the sixth. So we have a date in terms of um, the, the burials um, being placed on site on top of the building. So we have a sealant date of what the building could be. So we have another skeleton 477, but it's placed in an earth cut as well. Um, and there's no evidence of a coffin and it's an early complete remains of a young juvenile four to five years. And it's in orientated head north south in extended supine position. And it's right arm is extended along the body. Um, it's height, sorry, that's, and has evidence, forget the height, but um, evidence of lung infections and not possible to say whether tuberculosis or lung cancer, but it could have been caused by poor air quality. And that's another thing that has come out from other cemeteries, um, the, um, the lung infections that these Roman um, skeletons appear to have. 
And I always remember somebody saying about the poor air quality in terms of asthmatics. Living in York is not one of the best places for an asthmatic to be. Um, and once again, we've got the C14 date for this burial within a similar date range. Complex urban deposits appeared at 10.64, but the truncation made it very difficult to look at. But what we're looking at here are pits filled with CBM, box flue tile, with early indications of to support and early to mid um, first, second Roman date. The photograph illustrates a Samian Form 37 South Gold Bowl with a wreath of S-shaped gudrons and used by Crestio in 75 to 100 AD. The Samian, pottery, the Samian pottery is an important group of pottery, which includes many South Gaul decorated bowls that depict aspects of Roman life from hunting scenes, birds, animals, and with close parallels to Blake Street. Um, and I will, now I've got some statistical information that I'm gonna lead on to, which is quite really interesting with the parallels to Blake Street. The latest phase of structure, phase three, is represented by a building that was mostly comprised of clay, cobble pads or footings, roughly five, cent five meters square in plan. A great number of other structural fragments were identified, which may indicate that the building was more complex. The large assemblage of war plaster also suggests the internal nature of the building would have been more than basic. The latest phase of structure, phase three, um, has, has the burials of the perinates here, neonates within the settlement context. It's a well-known phenomena from the Roman period in Britain. In fact, in, in Romano-British context, it's usual to find burials of neonates in formalized cemeteries before, it, before the fourth century. It's not, they're not found until the um, fourth century. There are multiple examples of infant burials recorded in Romano-British domestic settings in Yorkshire including infants buried in association with villas at Beedlam, at Rudston, um, including the fort at Moulton, and detailed studies of infant burials at the Roman roadside settlement of Shipton Thorpe and domestic sites at Hayton, both in East Yorkshire, showed the majority of non-adult remains found were aged approximately 38 to 40.9 gestational weeks. Really interesting, also fit into that as well. And they've been shown to have been carefully and deliberately deposited within the domestic occupational <laughs> contexts. Likely deposition of burials in the early second to mid third century is from uh, another C14 date. And you can see this earlier date. Um, so presumably, if we're looking at structural deposition within the footings of that building, um, we've got the date range here for the building, and we've got the date where by the time the building had gone out of function with the burial that had cut it. Phase two activity is represented by the sill beams from timber buildings and cobble, purple, cobble pebble surface in the west of the site. This is, a court, is this a courtyard surface or the Roman Road 5? The phase one Roman de deposits can be described as a complex of intercutting features with the earliest consisting of various linears, pits and gullies. Now, this is where we're gonna get the, the change with the uh, additional information. The assemblage currently stands at 21,720 <coughs> shirts weighing over a ton and 400 small finds 600 samples and nearly a ton of CBM. Where is the evidence taking us? Well, we're gonna look at the Roman pottery now. And we've got 5,300 sherds, which makes it a, a large assemblage. And we have Neem Valleyware, indented beakers, tile with dog print, a Agricola stamp from the handle of a Dressel 20 um, of South Spanish origin, which was in operation the second half um, of the first century. The um, number of um, amphora that we have is really significant. The percentage of Samian is way above what we would normally see um, on a site. Um, 
selection of finds include stamp tile of the Ninth Legion. We have nothing for the Sixth. There, there are absolutely no tile for the Sixth Legion in the assemblage. And the assemblage consists of many elements associated with the military. It's not general rubbish deposits, and early examination hints at similar assemblages located at Blake Street. The fortress is circa 200 metres away, but the suggested fortress annex lies within 20 metres. At a cursory glance at the foundation of the annex, it would be in the late first century and continue into the mid third. If this foundation is confirmed, it would provide information on the function of the annex in connection to the fort. We have 31 wet stones, which provide evidence for tool sharpening on an industrial scale and another hint at a military connection with the slingshot. Significant deposits of slag suggest metalworking activities within the area. All the querns, bar two, are lava querns, commonly associated with the military. The large collection of glass fragments is suggestive of recycling waste. Other excavations previously mentioned add further evidence for a fort annex originally proposed by RCHME. On site describes a date range of both Roman and medieval deposits that parallels the Yorvik Hound site, and they conclude the existence of Roman walls within the Marygate area, including the discovery of a robbed out wall, which has led to the suggestion of a fortified enclosure existing, annexed to the Roman fortress. York Archaeological Trust describe a similar, if slightly later Roman date in the finds from Yorvik House, with finds from the finds assemblage, but recognises the significance of them. The report concludes there is clearly considerable structural evidence in terms of building materials, window glass, painted plaster, and structural fittings. The vessel glass is an exceptional collection and the pottery assemblage fills a useful gap in the ceramic tradition. There is also a varied collection of personal items. That's something we're limited on. We don't have many, including pins, beads, bracelets and fragments in a variety of material, including they had gold. The collection certainly merits, merits further study. And that excavation was carried out in 1992. And I think the way forward with both this site and the analysis is to combine the two and with on-site's work to bring the whole area of Marygate um, to publication. Whilst both these sites have smaller pottery assemblages on site having 68 sherds and New York Archaeological Trust 2000, the Yorvik Hotel is looking at over 5,000 Roman sherds and many different groups of finds associated, associated with industrial activity with limited personal adornment. This requires further investigation. The possibility of a fabrico type activities, which form part of the military supply system, is hinted at. And I think when we see the, um, the pottery breakdown, and we are looking at a uh, military activity, the military assemblage provides further evidence to support these activities being undertaken outside the fortress by members of the associated military community. This would not preclude the existence of an official fabrica somewhere within the fortress, but would point to the scale of supply necessary to support the legion. The associated military community, i.e. the civilian population, dependent on the fortress, and quite possibly the supply systems of other units in the north of England. Looking collectively at the evidence may provide the site, might provide the evidence to confirm these assumptions. The significance of the archaeological deposits on the site from both the medieval and the Roman perspective could never have been anticipated, but highlights the potential for future research. And that's this is where it all starts to come together in, in terms of supporting evidence. So I just produced this yesterday afternoon. Um, to just show you um, the course wares are at 53, uh, the salient is at 33%. That is quite an, uh, an exceptional amount of salient and there will be further work to understand what that actually means. But if you look at um, Blake Street, the comparisons are really, really interesting. And the Mortaria forms a body, a significant body, as does the Amphora. It's way above what would be expected um, from just an urban 
context, hence that push for the military. Um, the Yorvik Hotel has said has got over 5,000 shirts, and this is really impacted in terms of assessment. There are so many levels of, of fines that we've had to go through and go to different specialists. The specialists are taking between four and six months um, to come back uh, with assessment reports. But the latest news, the environmental is due in, in the next few weeks. And Diane has said, wow, there's some really interesting information coming out of pits. So watch this space. Jane Richardson is doing faunal remains. Um, she's going to take four months just because of the sheer volume um, and then fitting it into their programme. So there's still far more of the story to come out about this site. Um, the Samian compares well with Blake, she just said, with the South Gaulish where dominating and several examples of the illustrated form 27. This is a, it's quite a rare form, but you can see you can see how it's been deposited and um, where it's been affected with a bit wear and tear, but the, where it's been in the pit downwards, that hasn't been moved far. And that's a general trend in terms of the pottery. We don't have evidence of it being moved around and a lot of wear and tear. Um, so we've got an initial inspection giving for the same in uh, a predominance of Flavian to, tra to Dragtronic wares. And is there any evidence to val validate the existence of the annex? Well, I think there is. I think from what we're seeing that um, we need to be looking at what's the relationship to the site and the fort. And what did the site, when did the site cease to function other than for burials? I think we can safely say something happened in that mid third century that the buildings are abandoned. And what is the evidence for industrial activities um, and how is it supplying the fort? And um, I'd like to thank um, the team at MAP, Mark Stevens and Al Cross, Claire McRae from the City of York for being so patient and helpful, and Pete Wilson. Thanks, Paula. Um, that that was great. And just just to say that um, a lot of these, well, all of the all of the um, sites that we've heard about so far, and and the site that we're going to hear about next, um, they they're all um, investigations that take place as part of the planning process. They're not special projects or anything like that. So they're all part of um, planning applications, and they're all developer funded. Which, um, as you can imagine, with a site like um, Jorvik Hotel, where we get such an unexpected uh, quantity and quality of fines, that that brings up um, challenges, shall we say, in terms of funding, etc. Um, yeah, and all of these, um, eventually, all of these reports will also be available on the Historic Environment
What is interesting, you've got the cold rocks here, and the area that we're working on is just here. So when you look at area H, um, you will see in the Royal Commission, it details some of the graves. I don't think it details all of them. I think they've just picked out the fancy ones. If it is, they may have missed them. You'll see the bone preservation isn't that brilliant. We are still finding burials all over the place nearby. Was it the end of 2020 that we got some in the first class lounge at the rail station? So they're still popping up all over the place, not in Poltergeist sort of way, but they're still turning up when they're doing excavations. That would be quite disturbing. Um, Anglo Scandinavia through to post medieval. We have very little information about the site. They talk about the bishop's fields. There is potential for military archaeology. Century. They talk about encampment and an artillery, and it may be to do with the blowing up of Toss Tower, the second of Toss Tower, and also the bits in the city walls. We're not certain. We can't guarantee that. This is our um, map from around 1700. It's fields. So you could stand on the city walls and look out and say, I can remember when this was all fields. Um, then the railways came along. Back to our 1852 map, you can see that you've got the main line coming through, going off Scarborough, and then it would go in towards the city walls inside the station. So 1850 through to 1940, they've developed quite a lot. It's astonishing when you think just how much of an impact the railways have had on the whole area. Um, the site outline of the left wall is complicated further, but pretty much everywhere that isn't a raised area of ground that's been cut away or is in use for other things has been covered with railway lines or associated industries. You've had the Phoenix and Albion Iron Works, which has gone out of use and then been taken over by the railways. You can see where the new housing developments are down on Lehman Road. It's all railways. Everything's a railway, it seems. Um, this is a massive, massive landscape upheaval. And it's changed everything on the site. And it's trying to find out what's underneath these railways, but also what's important that survives of the railways, which is one of the big things that we're looking at as part of the mitigation of the archaeology on the site. Um, the system that we're working in is that on the outline mitigation strategy. And there's a nice flow chart that relates to basically looking at the deposit model, doing more evaluation work, feed it back into the deposit model, then looking at how we're going to mitigate the archaeology. This happens at every single stage of the process. So each of the new plots that comes online for development will be adding into the greater deposit model, the greater understanding of the site. IP2 is just getting hard, hit hard, because it's basically covering everything. That's why there's so much information coming through about it. So I've looked again at the archaeological evaluation and deposit model data because it wasn't working in my head with some of the stuff we did in 2018. Uh, we've updated the archaeological remains management plan and we've created an outline strategy for the mitigation of the archaeology in relation to IP2, which we're still developing as we go along, because obviously it's a massive site. It was impossible to do a 3% evaluation on it. It'd have been hit by trains if you'd done it the most of the time, because there were still tracks over most of it. Um, to aid the system that we're doing, we've adopted a triage system with a clerk of works, which is basically me. The idea being that every time they want to go into the ground, somebody tells me what they're doing, how deep they're going, and why they're going in the ground. I look at the information that we have in place and then say, well, this is your risk at the moment. And I'll feed that back to Claire. Just yesterday, I sent you some more details through for some remediation and contamination that's going on and also some more ground investigation test kits. <laughs> the big priorities are communication with the clients, communication with CISC, who are the main contractors, and then communication with Claire at CYC. It seems to be working so far. Seems to be working. So development as part of IP2. Um, we've got the roads, you can see them better now, they're coming in grey. There's also going to be a bridge going across the East Coast Main Line, so there's going to be a bridge of booklets, they're going to be diverting the diversion of the original Holgate back running through the site. Um, and then there's a strip map and sample area that we know about because of our Roman burials, which may extend it further, we don't know. We've got water attenuation tanks. There's also going to be sewer diversions and all of the sort of bits that keep popping up, because obviously developers, when they're developing, go, oh yes, but that's only small, it doesn't matter. It's like, well, what is it? It's, oh, it's going to be a six metre deep sewer diversion running through the middle of the site. Um, it can matter sometimes. And it's this idea of communicating on the process, make sure that everybody's aware of what's happening. Um, some of these marks where we're suggesting we're going to do some more in the way of mitigation and transect, but we'll see how we move forwards. Now, deposit model review, the stuff that was done before worked, but it didn't quite match what we've seen with some of the archaeological investigations. Um, You've got the York Court suggested outline there, St. Paul's Green there, and that green stone actually going to be running through here. 
Um, the way that the modeling works within GIS is that it will do an algorithm and it will basically say, yes, this is what I think is happening if I join up all these points. The problem is that sometimes there's more information that can go in and it doesn't think about how the landscape works. So redoing that roughly gives you this image. So instead of having Holgate Beck moving slightly to the side where the contours are drawn, we've got the line of Holgate Beck running through more. We do have other streams, which I'm going to talk about further, that go into this way. So just suggesting those within GIS holds the information back and it stops a large mass of about 15 metres above ground level, suggesting that everything has been trashed and put the railways in to actually being more of a landscape with small valleys and gullies and hollows in it that has been sealed when they put the railways in. So we have a buried landscape rather than a removed landscape. Back onto our 1852 map, you've got um, Holgate Beck running through, but you also have a realigned Beck where they've changed with the railway lines. You've got that Beck running up, oops, in that direction, I went forward and backward very quickly. Then. You've got another Beck there, and there's another one having not drawn on it, and where over here in the council offices. If you start to annotate that, apologies if those colours don't work with you, they were just the easy ones that worked with my eyes. Um, these orange points are the heights above 15.2 metres OD. These greeny blue areas are the heights below 7.6 metres OD. So you've got basically 25 foot difference, and that's this bit in the middle. You've got the streamlines running through. As I say, there's another one I've not drawn on here. On the mapping here, that says issues, which means it is stuff that is coming out of the ground. I am deeply suspicious that when they built the railway, they had collated the previous streams in this area. You will notice that those streamlines run in the middle of where the high points are, its shallow valleys. You've also got here, I coloured it green, it doesn't show up so well in green there. That is where you've got an embankment where they've lifted the railway lines up. These yellow areas are where they've made cuttings to cut the ground levels down. So when you start to look at that picture together, you've got Holbert Gate back running through. We know about the flooding issues with that. Some of it's been diverted way upstream where they did the main sewer work previously. You've got a streamline that's been messed around with here, but still survives running in these directions. And you've got a series of shallow valleys flowing into a tributary flowing into the ooze. This material here blocks off any chance of water flowing to the ooze from this part of the site. So it's flowing back on itself, which confuses matters. If I put this on the map that we have at the moment, you can see how it sort of compares to the rough out done previously. However, Claire will know this and other people have looked at the information. We've got a really significant organic deposit here. A stream runs through the middle of it. We've got really significant organic deposits that have been flagged up here. Streams run through them. We're basically looking at buried streams and the landscapes in relation to that. We just need to find a way to get the information out there, hoping that there isn't contamination from the railways era activity. Because this is wet, boggy ground, and you can get good radiocarbon dates that suggest prehistoric activity. But when those deposits have also got coal and brick in them, it makes it a little bit difficult to actually do it with great strength. Over here at the station side of things, four metres down, there's a medieval tile that came out of the peat deposit. So when we talk about the Kell holes and stuff that came out of St Paul's Green over here, it is four metres below ground level before they hit the organics. The peat layer is two and a half metres thick. In some of these areas, it's 10 centimetres. There's also a complication of our buried landscape because when you find it, things start to pop up. So what else have we been doing in 2021, 2022? There's been monitoring out of um, remediation down at Millennium Green. That shows where they've diverted the line of Holgate Beck. It's lovely to prove it, but it's not very nice to get through. We've been monitoring some more ground investigations. This one, if I recall, is next to the gasometer, which is next to Millennium Green. And we've got the previous ground level surviving at around two metres below ground level when they're buried at the aspect around. This is the Wagon Works mitigation. So remember the big Wagon Works building? When you look at the stuff online, there's some fantastic graffiti in the building. That's really good, really delicious. Um, underneath it, when they're pulling a road, there's obviously slabs and the inspection bays for when they're doing the work on the trains. They need to move. In the process of moving those, they found a whole series of stanchion bases 
relate to the lifting processes with inside the structure. That is around three meters across. I think they took 20 odd of those out. It took quite a lot of work with a 20 odd ton machine. Um, there's more remediation down the siding. So this is our lovely allotments that are used to be down there. Um, really nice stuff that's come out in the sense of mid 1960s pottery, if you're into 1960s pottery. Lots of bits of corrugated iron. Um, but again, it's just keeping an eye in case there's any more prehistoric, because this is near where the York Ford came out. And then this is where the Unipark car park's going in. So where the Unipark building used to be, they're building a new temporary car park. You can walk through it now as part of the diversions. It's a little bit disturbed at that end because that relates to our issues area. But this is about two, let's say 1.6 to two meters below ground level. We've got our buried ground horizon. And that buried ground horizon has soil with bits of medieval tile and blue and white pottery within it. This is our railway landscaping over the top of it. And that is an old track base that relates to the original curve around for the Scarborough line on those old maps. So it still survives. It's just a case of fishing it out. This deposit here, this stuff, they're going to go six metres through this material for the sewer diversion. And it's already been disturbed when the original sewers went nearby. <coughs> the one that everyone wants to talk about is obviously the race car park because we talk about Roman burials. Um, GI in 2018 indicated the natural hill survived in this area. We weren't sure if the raised area was completely man-made for the rail um, coal drops or if it had been artificial or if it was still the original hill there. GI indicated it was the original hill. 2020 evaluation found a single burial that suggested it was buried with another burial or possibly other in disarticulated materials with inside the grave backfill. We started to strip at the beginning of this year. In the initial stripping, we were starting to get quite a lot of the top end of flag and suggesting we've got libations going on, but it's been stirred by ploughing. And then we started to have graves popping up in quite neat regimented layout. On site, started the work in May. Many thanks to Graham and the team who've been doing the stuff from on site. I do not want to steal any of their thunder doing this. I'm just going to show some nice pictures. If their interpretations end up being different from this, it's because we haven't even washed the pottery yet. So if things change, I'll hold my hand up and say this is initial thoughts. Um, the number of graves was sort of as anticipated. But there's one area here, and it is visible here. This is the new Google Maps. If anybody wants to have a look around, you can't hide anything nowadays, can you? Um, this area is the one that was a bit of a pain in the bog. Um, we think at the moment at least 50% of the burials came from this tiny little area. So when you look at the distribution we have around here, it was pretty much right. We had to go a little bit further this way because of the gas line that needed to be mitigated. But we've got a very dense area of cremations, buster, and inhumations. There's around 150 in total. Some of them are empty, some of them are cremations. The bone preservation varies from very tall to not very good, which gives you an idea of what's going on. <laughs> this is an infant or young person when we did the first machine stripping. You can just about see a pair of thighs and shins in that. This is after careful archaeological cleaning of the same grave. You can just about see the thighs and shins, yeah? The bone is best described as paste. There is very little you can do with it. We had Marlin out on site to look over what was going on, but that just gives you an example of before cleaning and after cleaning. And you'll see why it's very difficult to get this bone surviving when we look at the Victorian truncation or the railways era truncation. This is another example of one of our reasonably preserved graves. Um, you've got a little bit in the way of bone. The spine itself is just a shadow. It's impossible to clean with normal archaeological tools, even if you're using clay modeling wood and stuff. It just doesn't survive. Some places it's a little bit better, as you'll see. Um, there's trends for the burials. We've got a sort of east-west alignment. We might have a ditch alignment that we can see in the burials, but I can't really 100% confirm that. What we do have is intercut burials that you can see on the plan, but we also have stacked burials. In one case, we think there might be five stacked on top of each other. This is not cut through. This is starting at the bottom and working upwards, and they sit exactly in the same space. This is unusual. 
Bay Ness had, I think, doubles when they were doing stuff up further up north. So this is one of the ones that we're going to need more research. And I'm going to hold my hands up and say I'm not a specialist when it comes to Roman graveyards. Um, more examples of graves. Here's a younger person. You can see the coffin stain survives really, really well. The bone survives very poorly. And then you've got a pot at the bottom of where the coffin is. Um, interestingly, when they talk about the railway excavations previously, they talk about possible prehistoric graves because they were crouch, which is what you expect sometimes with the INA side of things. These are definitively in the Roman graveyard. That one has been fitted into a hole that wasn't dug big enough for them. So it might have been a case of oh, uncle, whatever was so tall, we just gave it. But this is one of our deeper stacked elements. There's four on top of this that are laid out in a regular pattern. This one, unfortunately, lost the head. As you can imagine, the softness of the bone, trying to get these excavated without it collapsing is very difficult indeed. Very difficult, really good work by the team on site is all I can say. Um, here's a nice example of two. See the gravel at this bottom end. That gravel is actually that gravel. So this is on top of that one facing the other direction. So in theory, I should spin it around that way, but it looked bad when I put the kip up that way. Um, that's been put in a rudely excavated grave, and it might have been when they got to the foot end, they actually ended up over the pelvis and stopped. So it could have been a case of they've gone back in and gone, oh, hang on a minute, and we'll carry on burying them and flip them around. Um, better condition of this bone. This is some of the best examples that we've got on site. So these are the graves where it is deliberate, not accidental stacking there, going back in. There must be markers there, or there must be some reason why they're going back in. Again, I'm not going to chase into it in the presentation I'm doing at the moment. The pottery, because the bone is in such bad condition, it might end up being that the pottery is what we look at in more detail and gives us some of the best information from the site. I'm not going to have a competition about the stuff that we had down at because it's way better down there. Really nice pottery. We haven't got 6,000 million sherds or whatever it is that's come out. Um, but indented cups. We've got some nice um, little uh, colour count beakers there and then about three blanks that came out. And yes, we all made jokes about rubbing them to see if anything gets better because that's what you do. This is really unusual. I think there's one example of a lamp that's come from a burial in the city and a colour coat one. This is a funerary feature around this cluster of stacked graves. So again, we'll get more information when things have been closer washed. Other nice <laughs> examples, um, Ebor Flagon, you know, the one that we had at the start where it's been used possibly for libations, really nice decorated colour coat. And apparently there was a stamp on the bottom, but I wasn't there when it came off site and I haven't got a photograph of the stamp on the bottom team on site have. We've also got some other small finds including hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of coffin nails. Now, um, there's only so much you can do with coffin nails, but they've all been small finds and they will get x-rayed and they will get looked at. We've had some unusual iron objects coming out of the grave. Remember the head to foot example I showed you just earlier on? This is the lower grave of that. And that iron spike, rod, whatever it may be, is clearly underneath the bones of the wrist. This might be where they've gone in too deep when they did the excavation of the second grave and have disturbed it or put it in deliberately for all we know, or it might be that it was buried with them, or it might be part of the coffin furniture. We do have standard coffin now, but we've got an awful lot of fittings. They're not corner brackets, but they're fittings that seem to be larger. Again, the specialists will look at that. Um, standard vanity, vanity kit, this is actually within a larger pot. You've got your ear spoon and your tweed, and I assume it's going to be a pivot at the back. And whenever I think of ear spoons, I always think of um, cotton buds and being told not to stick them in your ears. But everybody sticks an ear spoon in your ears, which is perfectly fine. Um, one lovely coin came out towards in the latest stage of work that we've been doing. Uh, is it Constantinus, Constantius the second? And that is the one where it's spearing the fallen horseman. So there's basically some dude's office horse, horses going down, and then the brave Roman soldiers steering the barbarian. Don't quote me on this, 330-ish to 360-ish. So we've got pottery in the graves that's early to late second century, but we're getting coins that could be mid-fourth. So there's a good mixture of dates and material that's coming out. Now, the graves themselves, when you look at what we're going to do with the graves and how we can do it, we've also got to think of what we've got that survived. This is where the cow park formation is. So that's that original drawing that I showed you. 
at the top end, it's gone. The slope goes uphill in that direction, yeah? So the reason why there's no graves there is because during the railways era landscaping, they planed the top of the hill off. The graves then start to survive, and they start to survive a little bit better down this side. So this is where we've had our real dex area, and this is where we had surviving soil as a plough soil over the top. So the first truncation that we've got is medieval, maybe a little bit of angling, a little bit later, ploughing. And the graves have clearly been disturbed by ploughing, not all of them, but the shallower ones and the cremations. We've then got the disturbance from the actual railway landscaping where they've cleaved the top of the hill off and there's these drag lines that might actually be where they've been using some sort of either steam shovel or pulley line to drag the hill down the slope because we found disarticulated human bone down here. So they've just pulled the top of the hill off and you find it elsewhere on the side. There's then a large enigmatic cut and filled feature, which I haven't a clue what it is, but it's railways era. When we did some ground investigation here at three metres below ground level, there is a sleeper. I'm hoping it's not a row of sleepers with rails on the top, because that'll be quite awkward to try and do, because I've got to put a sewer diversion through the line of it across here, but we'll just see. We've also got interesting World War II features, which I'll talk about in a second, in a little bit more detail. And we've also got services. Round the outside, not drawn on this drawing, is a gas line that went in in around 1987 because there's a bag of crisps that came out of the backfill. <laughs> Through the middle here is a twin wall. You know that ribbed drainage system? The reason why we didn't anticipate these many barrels is because obviously you look at the density. However, they've been cut by that gas line and they've been cut by the twin wall drainage system. There are even reburied pottery and human bone deposits where people have found them and gone oops so we should have known about this this is one of the ones that should have been picked up because it's in the area of archaeological importance but when you look at that distribution of burials that explains why bits are missing so this is the victorian disturbance across the site that is a pair of legs and there's another leg there that dark layer and the crispy bit over the top is the Victorian clearance horizon. That is a skull that has been cut in half, not by me and a 14 tonne by machine, but it's been done by the Victorian clearance deposit. So that material there is concretion when they've been trampling around, when they've cleared the site. And that is another signal with the dark material. You can see how they're too much. That material has to be removed with a mattock or a machine. So you can understand how difficult it was, particularly with our very pasty bone, to get anything surviving at all. You're looking at a burial horizon that is that thick in some cases, and it's a discoloured paste. So the recovery of this material makes me think that some of the Victorian excavations in the past will have missed things. Not because they weren't trying, because they didn't see it. I'm also suspicious that so they might have dug the top grave and not thought about the other three or four beneath them. So some of the results that have come from the cemetery excavation in the 1800s cannot be blamed, but there might have been more that have been missed. Now, whilst we were digging, this website became live, um, Historic England and the new bomb mapping, and we had all the information coming through from the BDEC arrays. Yeah? This is a photograph the following day. You can see the cold rocks at that end, the stations over here, where are over here, and then you've got the lines coming through. That is a bomb crater. From the B decorate. That is a bomb crater from the B decorate. This material is where they've actually had to rebuild the external wall that is the supporting wall for the raised terrace. That still stands, and you can see it on the 3D Google mapping now. There's a section of wall that's got expansion joints in it. And you can see it's got a concrete backfill. So they've had to dig out where the wall's been damaged, and it wasn't repaired instantly, it's been done decades later. This is the infilling of the actual hole from the bomb crater, which is the equivalent of that on an online picture of bomb craters. This material with the stripes in it is the equivalent of that material where it's been lifted and redeposited around the outside. And then you've got the natural material elsewhere. It makes a really difficult machining process. 
because everything gets lifted up. And what was a nice hillside sloping downwards has got this puckered up lump that's got Roman remains in it that you have to try and machine around. And you can see that is the stripy area, that is the backfill, that is the raised natural ground level where the bomb's gone in, bang, and lifted everything around it. This is what it does to burials. It was very difficult to find the grave cut on this because it's been disturbed. They thought that they hadn't been able to get the feet, but what's actually happened is that the shins have been lifted upwards and pushed backwards over the thighs. Every single long bone has been broken by the shins, and that's a testament to how strong your shins are. That is some of the best archaeology I've ever seen because it's fantastic. We're looking at how different impacts on archaeology occur through time, and obviously world time stuff, and how the graveyard in the Roman sense has been blown to bits, to be quite honest. It's fantastic. This is the second ever bomb crater I dug. The first one was by Allied and Canadian forces back in 1994. Really good stuff. So we are going to continue with the IP2 works, and it's continuing as planned. Um, each time a new plot on the site opens up for development, you're going to have the reserve matters application, you're going to have the same process of updating the deposit model, we're going to be evaluating whether it's Tetratech or other companies, that's the way we're moving forwards. Um, there will be public engagement, we're sorting that out with the clients at the moment, obviously this is the first time we're showing stuff that's been going on with that, but you don't want to be talking about a graveyard when it's open to the elements as such. Um, we will be doing public engagement. We just need to decide exactly how it is. Obviously, you can see the team downstairs, what they're doing with the um, York Central books and the whole, you can't see the question mark, to be honest. I'm currently on site on and off at the moment looking at different things. We've looked at stripping the bottom half of the car park just recently, which is where we got the bomb crate and stuff. And just as an example, that sort of ground level, but obviously I have the tarmac on top of it. This is the machine we've been stepping down to get to it. That is sort of the base of the previous plough soils, developed soils. Those are roots, yeah? There's a tree stump that's gone there. That's a tree stump that was two and a half metres below ground level. The top of it's been sawn off and they've just landscaped over the top of it. That tree stump is probably that tree there on the map if it's been drawn correctly. Because you can see the grave excavation just in the background. That's where our bomb crater is. And this is just the other side of the bomb crater. I'm not suggesting it is that tree, but it would be really, really nice if it was that tree. To dig a tree up that's on a map. Come on. <laughs> I've done a fish and chip shop that was on a map. I found a tree. Everything gets better. You can't beat life like that. So obviously we're going to be doing public engagement. Obviously, questions are coming up. I really want to thank Home and the rest of the team, not just because they're downstairs, they're really good. Um, John Sisk and Son, who are the main contractors, fantastic to work with, really nice people, really helpful. And then obviously, we've got the team from on site. I'm hopefully we haven't stolen any of their thunder when it comes to the Roman graveyards. Um, but they really do need thanks. Everybody's doing a really good job out there, particularly with the ridiculously hot summer that we had, and then trying to dig things when it got a little bit wet, as we're getting at the moment. Okay. Uh, thanks, Toby. That was that was a really interesting talk. Lots to fit in. Uh, I appreciate. So um, now we'll go to questions. So we had um, Marina and Paul on Burbridge Road drink houses. We've got Paula who was talking about Yorvik Hotel and Booth and Crescent and Toby on York Central. So we've got two mics that we can pass around the room. Um, if you've got a question, just raise your hand. Lots of questions. Do you want to start over there with Eric? Eric Matthews, this is a question for Paula about the kiln at the Yorvik Hotel. Uh, I know it's probably a bit early, but has any thought been given to where the uh, the, the marketing area for the, the pottery that was made there, because it looks from certainly the jugs, very similar to uh, examples that we've been finding at Hornby Priest's House near Beedale, and there is a documented connection between St Mary's Abbey and, and the church at Hornby from the, the 12th century through until the, the early 16th.
sorry. Um, that's why I drew out that we need to do that to research. I think they probably has a connection to St Mary's Abbey, um, the production, and that that's it's it's close enough to be supplying. Yeah, yeah, that's what we think, but we haven't got the documentary evidence. So, Good. watch this space. <laughs> Morning, uh, Gary Frost. Uh, I'm keen to learn more about archaeology. Just a couple of questions, firstly, about pollen analysis and yeah, how long has that been around and what can you get out of it? Just really briefly, please. Second question was, is on the last one about the um, impact of the, the soft uh, skeletal remains and yeah, what is the uh, mechanism, uh, chemical conditions in the soil, presumably, but what, what is the, the mechanism that's ha happening there? Again, really briefly. Toby, I'm coming to you. <laughs> you can answer both. Oh, oh, for absolutely ages. Absolutely ages. So um, if you want a good introduction, just do um, look at the English heritage stuff on site. They've got some really good stuff on the environmental archaeology side of things. Um, and any any plant remain that you can get will help you get a clue about the site. You just need to think about the depositional process. So you can look at plant remains completely divorced but then you think about the depositional process and you start to get a better idea because the, the classic example is you might have a pit that's full of stuff that says that there is um, production of um oh sorry there is a specific wildflower growing in this area which is great but it might be that that is one person that grows it on their garden on purpose because it's pretty so you have to think about the process and when it comes to the bone we're, we're not sure about the bone preservation because it varies so much across the site if you look at coal, coal is very acidic, and it could have been that the Victorian railway manipulation of the landscape has created a track base that's got lots of acidic material in it that's percolating through the ground and dissolving the bone more so. So the deeper burials, in theory, should be in better position, better preservation, but it doesn't always work that way. And you will sometimes get an isolated acidic environment which dissolves bone more that develops within the bathtub shaped hole within a grave, if that makes sense. Uh, one for Toby. That was a really good presentation. Really enjoyed that. Um, a lot of interesting stuff there. I really like your approach to the understanding the site formation. It's great. Um, following on from the previous chap, actually, um, you were talking about the peat deposits that you found. Have you taken any pollen samples from them? Are you, are you expecting to go back to take more or diatoms or anything like that? I'll speak into that. Yeah, um, the, the, the stuff at the moment, we, we, we're at the moment isolating where it is before we go into it because we want to try and get it clean. Because a lot of the sampling that's gone on already has come back and it's come back with the right dates, but really poor conditioned pollen. There's not been statistically enough to actually get information out of it or it's come back contaminated. So at the moment we need to isolate. And as you've seen from the buried tree, we need to isolate if it's actually a prehistoric landscape or if it's an 1864 and it was chopped off tree buried landscape. Because a lot of the information that's come back previously from previous studies is from the, the drilling engineers, you know, the guys with the cable percussion or the window samplers. And when they're pulling information up, they record it as a Ron seal. They're very much a case of, I record what I see. So if they found something organic, they call it peat. It doesn't mean that it is anything in the way of fantastic peat. It could just be peat. So I'll be working with the Tetra Tech ground investigation team, and they'll say it's a peaty deposit, and I'll go, yeah, and it's got blue and white pottery in it, and it's clearly modern roots. And it's like, but it goes on our form as peat. So at the moment, we're, we're isolating where we're going to go in, and we're discussing with Claire, and then when we go back in, that's when we're going to try and get the cleanest samples that we can get. Gail, do you want to take some from the other side? One at the back. Uh, this is another question for Toby. Thank you for that interesting talk. I, I apologise in advance. It's about the osteology. <laughs> so let me know if I just need to email Malinholz. Um, really interested by those stacked burials. Very exciting to have them in York. Um, I know that similar practice was identified up in Patrick and Bayoness by NAA's recent um, excavations and I was wondering of course there's the potential that these might be family groups and I wondered if the 
preservation of the bone means that a DNA analysis of them to answer some of those questions is impossible or whether that might be possible? I'm going to drop out Marlin, sorry, for Marlin's site visit, and I'm going to, Marlin, because I was at university, but she knows far more about human bone than I ever will. Um, yes, probably, is what she said. <laughs> so hopefully we'll see, and it, it'll be fantastic if we can, because the preservation of the bone isn't that great across the site, and just trying to get these things clean, we're going to lose most of the information. So we've had to spend more time cleaning and recording on site to probably get the osteology report as an actual photograph in many cases but yes hopefully uh Stephen Hemingway I used to be in archaeology uh decades ago when I was a student uh regarding the reference to the Roman annex uh what actually was it and the other question is tied in with it does the presence of Samian in such a large quantity indicate it could have been a reasonable high status complex thank you the royal commission um suggested um that there was a possible annex to the fort um and the work, recent work by both york archaeological Tr trust and on site and our work um seems to confirm that there is an area that potentially could be the annex. Um, we're looking at, yeah, when you say about, could it be a high status? I think even with the levels of pottery that we've got, we're looking at a military occupation for that area. So hopefully that that's where we're maybe leaping to an assumption that we've got the evidence for the annex, but that's where it's pointing at the minute. Um, so hopefully that, does that help? More questions? <laughs> I, I wanted to ask uh, a couple of questions of the first two contributions. Um, the one along Tadcaster Road the, is just one question, which is how do those ditches align with respect? I know they're a long way back from Road 10, but do they align to Road 10? And if so, what does this tell us about the date at which that was set up? And the, the question, the second one is for both of both of the first two, which is you said you had early and late Roman and material from the site and at some points you sort of said continuity through the Roman period or something like that and I just wondered if you could say a bit more about where this later Roman stuff comes from is it actually down in the primary deposits in those ditches or does it come from later material redeposited into the top of the ditches in which case it would suggest that there's a big change to the use of that landscape in the late Roman period compared to the early Roman thank you Second question first. Uh, the later material came from um, the pits and the short little ditch on the eastern side of the site. Um, now that that short ditch was primarily filled with sand. Um, all of the material apart from the glass came from the base of it. Um, however, given the conditions and you know the 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 possibility that that might that material might have actually sunk down to the base in in wet weather um it's difficult to really say whether it was actually at the top of the uh fill or the base we did find it at the base and it is um it is uh the latest material um just the point that i didn't actually mention was that we did have a ceiling layer over those um stone cairns on the eastern side um where we were getting um 10th century pottery fragments in there, but I think they're probably residual. So it was over in that that eastern side. Um, with regard to um, continuation, um, it would have been nice to actually dig all of the ditches to get a fuller picture of what the pottery profiles were in, in terms of chronology. But um, all we can say is that we've got a, a progression of dates um, that appeared appeared to show um, continuation of enclosure over the full Roman period. Um, so at the moment, until we can get a sort of bit more analysis and a bit of closer close look at some of the pottery from Area D, uh, which we haven't looked at yet, um, 
the, the phasing is um, preliminary. Um, I hope, hope that helps. Uh, yeah, I agree with Paul. We have similar findings. Our ditches, some of them were aligned parallel to the to road 10, I would say, but not all of them were. Most of them were not aligned. They were, it was uh, west, roughly east-west aligned, most of them. But we can tell that they were most likely used for the drainage of either the main road, road 10, or some other roads around the area. Um, in terms of dating, again, it was very hard because most of those ditches were constantly recut and reused, so we couldn't date them entirely from the pottery. Or so we need we need further analysis to to say for sure. Thank you. Is that okay? Any further questions? Any of the speakers this morning? No. Don't leave me hanging. Any more questions? Not missing anyone? No. I don't think so. Okay, well, if there's no more questions for this morning, speakers, um, we'll we'll make that lunchtime. Um, Lucy from Yorkshire Museum is going to be um, setting up some um, interactive displays for the Rydale Horde over lunchtime on these tables. Uh, there's still tea and coffee at the back. If you haven't had one yet or you want another one, go and grab one now. Um, and there'll be further tea and coffee at about three o'clock in the break. But um, otherwise, we'll see you back for um, this afternoon's talk starting at 10 to 2. Thank you very much.
Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Hello, everybody, and welcome back uh, to this afternoon's uh, part of the conference, which is going to have uh, a focus on uh, archaeological projects across the city and then um, a couple of talks on conservation. Um, we've had a bit of feedback from those watching online regarding sound and the red uh, pointer, which we were using this morning, because obviously that hasn't gone through to the uh, the live stream, which we've realised. So we've we've tried to rectify that, which we've got a red pointer on the screen now. So hopefully everyone can see that at home as well. And um, for those that are speaking, um, as I said at the start, there is a there is a mic you can clip onto your um, clothing. But if you just stand and speak directly into the microphone like I am now, that's probably the best way for everybody to hear. So um, our first speaker of the afternoon is Professor Martin Millett um, from the University of Cambridge, who's had a bit of an epic uh, journey up here this morning. Um, so if I welcome Martin up. Uh, to the lectern, and he can start his talk on his project, Roman York Beneath the Streets. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. Um, uh, if I look slightly jaded, it's because uh, the East Coast Main Line is being refurbished. So uh, the uh, it took three and a half hours to get here this morning, leaving at five to six. Um, uh, wish me luck in getting home afterwards. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and um, I was thinking as I was uh, sort of sitting on an interminable train journey coming up this morning um, that one of these sessions about four years ago um, was what led to the research grant application that has led to the work that I'm going to introduce you to today. And we had quite a spirited discussion, I think Patrick's in the middle of the room there, um, about um, whether we could actually conceive of drawing all the information together on Roman York and uh, rethink it. And the project that I'm going to talk to you about today um, is the product of um, the thinking around that um, it's a joint project um, with uh, John Crichton at the University of Reading. Um, we've got a research associate, Thomas Matthews Burmus, who some of you will have met, who's working with me in Cambridge, and Levin Verdonk from Ghent University. And the work's being done in collaboration with, uh, in partnership with uh, York Archaeological Trust and York Museums Trust. Um, um, just to be fair, and if um, I think Ailes is going to walk out at this stage, um, uh, I'm going not, I haven't got lots of new results to show you. I've got a few new results, but I want to show you what we're trying to do, why we're trying to do it, how we're trying to do it. And we should have um, results, I hope, um, beginning to flow through uh, over the next uh, 12 months or so. We've got a, we've been going for 12 months now on the project. Uh, we've got another 18 months to run. And the basic idea is, as I've just uh, said, uh, in terms of discussions here four or five years ago, so, um, if we're going to understand Roman York, uh, we need to appreciate there's a lot of work that has been done. Um, a lot of that work was pulled together um, in the famous Royal Commission volume 1962 down here, but that is more than half a century ago, well over half a century ago. And most of the work was done in the 1950s. Um, there have been subsequent syntheses, and the two editions of Patrick's book on Roman York have pulled things together um, in a fantastic way, uh, giving us a coherent narrative of what we think we know about Roman York. And uh, most recently, that information has, of course, been drawn together uh, both cartographically and uh, in text in the Historic Towns Atlas. And what um, the, this shows is a, a pattern of uh, Roman development with our legionary fortress uh, from 
the uh, 70s AD, the area that uh, Paula was talking to us about uh, this morning out here, suggesting that uh, material of that period is spreading across along the river bank. Uh, the development of a civilian settlement, often called the Colonia, uh, on the south bank of the river here, uh, with a lot of evidence that that's coming through uh, basically as a late second, third century development, perhaps associated with the uh, imperial uh, presence uh, in York. And beyond the uh, Colonia and the legionary fort, uh, we have other things around the fortress, and we have massive evidence for Roman cemeteries, probably one of the best explored and most extensively explored sets of uh, Roman cemeteries uh, in Britain. But since the syntheses have been done, and in particular since uh, the development of planning-based archaeology um, from the principally from the 1990s onwards. Um, the amount of information we've got from York has greatly increased, and um, we haven't really revisited our interpretations in a complete way. We've progressively revised them and rethought them, but we haven't uh, we haven't given it a, a radical sort of kicking of the tires. And uh, it's it become increasingly clear that with different archaeological bodies working in York, that the, um, the time is ripe for trying to draw um, everything together in new ways. So our project, which is funded very generously by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, that for uh, those of you who haven't worked it out, is you through your taxes, so I'm grateful to you for your support, um, is to do a project that uh, tries to do a series of different things um, to work towards uh, a new understanding of Roman York, drawing together all the information we've got. Uh, the elements of the project are effectively, um, at the core of it, a new database um, that's drawn from the historic environment record and the City of York Council have been uh, very helpful through Claire uh, in making this available to us. Um, we are um, revisiting that and um, we hope to enhance it so that when we finish, we can feed the stuff back in to help with the planning process uh, moving forward. And it's, in doing that, we're drawing on um, all the past excavated evidence that we can find, all the material that we can find uh, with our collaborators in the museum. And um, importantly, going back over the antiquarian um, records, I'll say a little bit more about this in a moment, um, to see how much more information there is in them than was fully pulled out in the 1950s by the Royal Commission team. Against that database side of things, um, we are working with Chris, who's speaking after me, and I'm going to leave this bit very much to her, on working, um, reworking um, and updating the deposit model to try and understand um, what the topography underneath the Roman city is, what the natural topography is, and how that's developed and built up specifically for us through the Roman period. The third element, um, which I've spent a little bit of time on at the moment, is a new program of survey work, specifically survey work uh, using ground penetrating radar to look at areas within the city that are available for geophysical survey. Um, and the idea there is we won't be able to excavate, but we will be able, we hope, to uh, map some of the features underneath the uh, streets and in other open areas in order to link together the fragments of evidence that we have from uh, excavation and from antiquarian work. And that's tied together with uh, a public participation outreach project, um, which is being um, led by uh, the York Archaeological Trust, uh, which will have a volunteer program that we're um, launching shortly uh, to enable um, 
interested people to participate in, particularly to work on uh, looking at uh, older uh, published and unpublished sources. And uh, we hope that if this works, we will create um, new baseline information to be used for the future through the HER and through other means, and um, some uh, publication that will offer new thoughts on uh, developing the understanding of um, the Roman city. Now, I don't want to go through, um, you'll be glad to hear at this stage in the afternoon, uh, the database structure, but I do want to make the point um, that what we're trying to do is to take all these different sources of information and bring them together um, in one place um, in a computer database with linked mapping, a database and GIS. That involves not just the excavated plans and so forth, um, where, which we are digitizing, but also um, evidence on the collections of finds and objects and linking the things that are in the museums. Um, so um, on my last slide, I had that very fine um, inscription uh, from the city. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. What we want to do is to link things like that, the major objects in the museums, as well as the minor objects in the museums, uh, in space and in the database, so that we can fit everything as far as possible back together. And in doing this, uh, what we're trying to do is to provide some form of standardization. So using the latest uh, understanding of, for instance, uh, Roman pottery and applying that um, retrospectively uh, to previously excavated assemblages so that um, it won't be uh, detailed work that you would, as you would get in an excavation report, but it will mean that um, everything is dealt with more or less in the same way. Um, Richard Brickstock has done that for the coinage already. Uh, we're integrating his work. Um, we're doing using other sorts of finds, things like brooches and so forth, of which there are many, uh, where there's been a lot of work in the last few decades showing how that could be that information can be used to understand the life ways of the people in the city and um, importantly using the finds assemblages to try and understand um, the, whether different parts of Roman York were operating in different ways occupied by different sorts of people so forth the sorts of thing that Paula was touching upon in her talk this morning saying this assemblage looks as though it's military um, are there other assemblages that resemble military assemblages in parts of the city that we we don't um, we haven't thought about in those terms? In other words, gathering the information together so that we can use it to characterize uh, space changes through space and time in the city, and linking that uh, also with the environmental evidence, the animal bone evidence, the seed evidence and so forth, of which um, there is um, a huge amount. We're at an early stage in doing this um, with our colleagues in um, York Archaeological Trust, Jane Comish and Adam Parker in the York Museum Trust. We have gone a long way in the last 12 months to getting um, all the modern excavations uh, into a database uh, that the um, archaeological trust uh, we've got I think everything from their archives now in we're probably about halfway through getting the York Museum Trust material into the system um, when we uh, put the grant application in uh, we were aware of 477 evaluations 1,352 watching briefs and 337 excavations. There are more now. Um, it's growing all the time, but that gives you an idea of the volume of information we've got. And um, uh, Thomas, who's uh, working on this in Cambridge, um, is uh, busily, uh, I hope, 
working on its Saturday, you know, so he shouldn't be busily working on putting the stuff into a GIS. Um, but uh, this is what's going on, putting all those things into a spatial form uh, with coding so that we can see what period things are. So when we have um, uh, excavations in the future, like we were hearing about this morning from drink houses, where you've got a series of excavations uh, around the area, instead of the person who's digging the one particular site, you should be able to pull this down and see how your site fits in. That will help um, people doing future archaeological work in the city. It will also help Claire and her team uh, assess planning applications as they come in. And um, this is at an early stage that getting this into a GIS is a pretty huge project. Um, but things are beginning to show up already. And I just take an uh, example from just outside uh, Micklegate here, uh, which uh, Thomas has been working on recently, uh, where we've superimposed this supposed line of the Roman road on the uh, existing map and showing the uh, the archaeological evaluations and so forth. And what this shows is that the um, line of the road can't be right. There are buildings where uh, the road is, um, that there must be a road coming down there. So can we uh, realign the roads to take account of the evidence? And um, the other thing that's uh, clear in this particular example, um, and Thomas has been having a great time uh, putting all the skeletal evidence in, is that the, um, we're getting bits of Roman cemetery down here as we get all around Roman York. Um, what's evident from this is that the cemetery isn't, um, or the cemeteries in this area aren't uniformly organized and they're not apparently aligned on the street structures. Now, elsewhere in the city, we can see that the cemeteries do work in that way. So as we put the um, bits of the jigsaw together, but it doesn't quite make a jigsaw because you've got lots of the bits missing. Um, by having all the bits in the right places, you can begin to say things that go beyond what could be said about an individual excavation. That, in essence, with the database, uh, what uh, we're aiming to do. Um, one of the, uh, for me, most interesting and um, a promising side of the work is actually going back to the antiquarian sources. And um, York is extremely rich in antiquarian information. Um, there's been really good work done on Roman York uh, since the uh, early 18th century. And this uh, evidence has been drawn together. Um, uh, Scaife in the 1860s drew a lot of it together. And I've just given you um, the area from um, his plan, which is in uh, the record office here, uh, of uh, the building we're, we're in. Um, this, we're, we're up here. Um, and it's this sort of information that was drawn on uh, showing where uh, baths and so on and the mosaics under uh, the street just behind us here um, were found, it was drawn together well in the 19th century. This has fed through into the Royal Commission work and uh, subsequent work. But quite a lot of the time, um, what's happened is that people have looked at the last person to um, publish it and added to it and um, uh, corrected it to some extent, uh, but largely built on it as building blocks. What we're trying to do is go back to the primary sources. So um, I myself have read all the 18th century uh, sources uh, for York and Thomas has been doing a fantastic job of this. Um, and what this illustrates is that there's a massive amount of detail in information um, that hasn't always been uh, followed through into the text. Uh, um, just to give an example, um, this is um, the York Herald from the 7th of October, 1854, um, with an account of the uh, Yorkshire Philosophical Society's meeting. Um, 
great stuff, which gives the details of the discovery of um, this inscription we saw earlier, uh, which was reported at the meeting. And it tells us where it's found. Well, if you could get that from going to uh, Roman inscriptions of Britain, but it also tells us the depth below the street and so forth. And in other newspaper accounts, in particular the newspaper accounts of the very early 19th century, uh, there is a lot of information that was uh, hasn't really been passed through. So the uh, the, the well-known um, Micklegate Mithraic inscription is described its discovery in the newspaper with the address of the house where it was found. Um, so what we believe is that um, by going back through this, uh, we can enhance uh, knowledge with material that's um, really already there on um, open to view, so to speak. Uh, the newspapers are digitized, the gentleman's magazine uh, is digitized. Um, these things uh, are there if people are willing to spend time uh, following through and thereby enhancing our understanding and in some senses um, correcting uh, misreadings of the evidence that has come through, uh, particularly through the Royal Commission work in the uh, 1950s that has su subsequently um, been uh, sort of incorporated into understanding. The next element I'm not going to say anything more about, which is this deposit modeling, that if we're going to understand Roman York, we need to understand um, what's going on uh, when the site is first occupied and see what the ground surfaces are there. Um, and it that really a brilliant talk before lunch, York Central, where you could see why that's important when development comes about today. But it's also important uh, for understanding the nature of the settlement as it existed, what the topography was like, what the environment was like, and so forth. And uh, I, we'll be hearing uh, from Chris uh, and uh, her team about uh, the work that's being done on that. And here we have um, one of those uh, great uh, coming together that we have a, a two projects, our project that is interested in the bottling and the uh, Historic England funded uh, City of York work that Chris is going to talk about. And what we're using is uh, combining resources from those uh, to push that element of the work together. But the element that is um, probably uh, of most potential, but also most risk in the project um, is uh, going for uh, new forms of uh, archaeological survey. And here, um, what we are intending to do, or what we're uh, actually actively doing, is to use ground penetrating radar um, to look at the city. Uh, ground penetrating radar, um, I'm happy to talk offline about the technology of it, um, is a technique that has been around for a few years, but it's been uh, developed uh, very greatly in the last few years uh, through the development of both the technology for collecting the data, the antennae, but most particularly through the development of computer software and high capacity computing uh, to deal with the results. And when you look at York, you say, well, this is possibly not a great target for uh, radar. Um, but when you look at Google Earth, there's act there are actually quite large areas of green space um, in York um, that are accessible. Uh, so they form one target. The other uh, target that we're interested in is um, the uh, armature of the city, so to speak, the streets, which um, offer uh, transects through uh, Roman York. And um, as we'll see in a moment, uh, GPR has some potential uh, for that. And um, the project really divides our GPR into two sets. One set um, is using um, 
conventional type of GPR uh, that I've used successfully, as we'll see in a moment, um, on sites, for instance, in Italy, uh, where we approach the large uh, green spaces, particularly the spaces uh, behind the Minster in this area and the spaces in the museum garden area here. And um, with this, uh, we uh, use a, a series of uh, radar antennae um, towed behind a quad bike uh, that are set up so that you can take um, readings at very close intervals. So the work that uh, Leave and Bedon uh, pictured here has been doing with us in Italy, um, we've been taking uh, radar readings every six and a half centimetres across um, whole Roman towns. Um, and this is where the computing capacity becomes important. Um, the Fallery survey that you can see an example of on the screen here um, produced 56 billion data points. So uh, getting that into a format where you can see with radar um, different depths of um, archaeological deposit uh, it requires a very formidable um, archaeological um, computing. Where it works on sites as these in Italy, um, that gives a, a really stunning uh, view of what is buried. And um, it does this uh, in a way that enables you to differentiate what is buried at different depths. The challenge with this uh, for us is that um, the depths of archaeological deposits that we've been dealing with in Italy um, are normally in the range of uh, zero to minus 1.75 or minus two meters. They go down a bit more than the uh, depth of my height. Um, in York, we know that the archaeological deposits are generally uh, much deeper. We did some experimental work uh, with this, at, with um, Helen Goodchild from the Department of Archaeology when we we're putting our um, project together, um, looking at a couple of samples um, around the Minster. Uh, and uh, we tried two different antennae, um, which showed um, that we were able to get uh, archaeological features uh, down to uh, one point two meters or so, uh, that it was possible to see at least the uh, the top levels relatively clearly, and without going through the detail of this, to pull out features that tie in with those from uh, earlier excavations. But uh, what we need to do in order to move this forward to do the large areas um, that we are planning to do within the project in York itself is to uh, test different um, uh, antennae uh, in order to see what works best. And um, Leven uh, spent uh, three weeks or so um, in the area by the Minster Library um, in August, uh, beginning to do this um, with a bewildering array of different um, uh, radar antennae from different manufacturers of different uh, uh, specifications. And uh, the reason that we chose this area is um, it's immediately adjacent to the area that was dug in the 1990s, published in uh, 2016, uh, where we knew the depths of the Roman deposits and we could see the structure of the Roman deposits. Uh, so we could uh, calibrate the uh, uh, radar results against the uh, known archaeological depths. Now, um, Leven is still working on this, and at the moment, um, we're only seeing um, in the results I've seen so far, um, the shadows of some of the deeper archaeological deposits. Um, what we are seeing, um, and you see here for the first time 
in public, um, our um, later medieval deposit showing very clearly. Um, if we have nothing else from this, uh, we now have uh, very good evidence for the uh, plan of the Archbishop's Palace uh, adjacent to the Minster Library. Um, we have it, uh, I think, um, a dozen times with different radar antennae, uh, but very clear uh, evidence. I'm just showing you a sample of it there. But we are confident that um, uh, Leven's work will enable us to at least see the shadows of uh, some of the deeper buildings uh, in one or two of the sets of results. Uh, you can begin to see that and features that are aligned with the known uh, Roman military uh, structures. The um, other work uh, we have begun um, is to look at um, the archaeology underneath the streets. And here um, we deal with a different set of equipment, uh, which equipment uh, largely towed behind uh, a van, um, which uh, for those of you interested in it has a variable frequency. So it could go uh, to uh, greater or uh, lesser depths. And um, in uh, July and in uh, October, um, we were able to um, use this equipment with a company called CAT Surveys, um, looking at um, the areas that are colored uh, on the map here. Um, we've covered 16, I think, kilometers of streets uh, in the city. And I'd hope to have some results to show you. We're still processing this. Um, this is um, a big gamble. Um, the, it's a gamble in two senses. Uh, one is that although these machines are used very commonly for mapping services um, in cities uh, uh, now, um, they've not been used um, accepted one uh, instance in very different circumstances for trying to look deeper. Um, in theory, uh, they do. Uh, we don't know whether they do. It will also depend, the other gamble is whether the uh, underneath the streets is so heavily messed up by services that there's no archaeology surviving. But we've gathered the information we will know soon whether this is going to work. And if it does work, um, it gives us um, a huge amount of new information. <laughs> Importantly, um, in York, because it, with the exception of the sort of legionary fortress area, um, most of our streets are offset from uh, the Roman ones. So we should be able to pick up, if we can see things, um, elements of the planning of the city uh, that uh, will, I hope, shed new light on the overall structure of the Roman town. So keep your fingers crossed and pray for us. Uh, the other thing that GPR can do, which is um, important uh, if it works is that because of the radar signal um, won't doesn't work through water it enables you to monitor the water table depth and in the areas where we know um, uh, the we're not going to get uh, good structural results uh, because most of the Roman structures that we know of are timber and they won't show up with GPR uh, the GPR results, may form a very useful um, measure of how deep the water table is. In other words, mapping the areas where uh, waterlogged deposits um, might still survive. And um, there is uh, some discussion going on about uh, uh, developing further work on this if the uh, technology uh, is proving um, successful for us in this. So what the GPR is, is a big gamble. Um, there is a lot to be gained if we can gain information both in these large greenfield areas um, and 
in the uh, street areas. Uh, I wouldn't say that I'm hugely optimistic about the quality of information we're going to get. Um, it's very unlikely that we will replicate the sorts of information we produced, for instance, uh, Valerie Novi in Italy, where we've got um, the whole town plan uh, laid bare using this technology. But I think it is one of the ways in which uh, we may be able to move forward in our understanding of the topography and the development of the Roman city. The other aspect of um, our work is uh, work where we want to try and develop um, great public understanding. We've got public understanding uh, through uh, presentation. We're going to be doing work with um, YMT and YAT uh, in presenting the results we're getting. We've got an art program uh, that will be associated with this, organized by YAT. And as I said earlier, uh, we have uh, are on the verge of uh, launching uh, a volunteer program through uh, YAT to involve um, interested volunteers, particularly in looking at uh, antiquarian sources, uh, newspapers and so forth, to try and pull out uh, some of this information. And alongside this, um, there will be an education program for schools. So um, in summary, I hope this gives you um, a good understanding of what we're trying to do, how we're trying to do it and why. And I hope I'll have the opportunity to come back um, as we uh, come through this project uh, with um, some results for you. I'm sorry if you came today expecting to see results uh, rather than just process. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Martin. So um, moving on, we've got um, Chris from York Archaeology and Virgil from AOC, who are here to talk about the City of York uh, deposit model, which does have some crossover with Martin's project. So I'll let them take it away. <clears throat> OK, wow. So we're all still here in the afternoon. Excellent. Um, my name is Christina Kravitz. I'm the head of geoarchaeology for York Archaeology, part of York Archaeological Trust. And I'm here today to talk to you about the City of York Deposit Model Project, along with my co-investigator Virgil from AOC Archaeology. Um, project is also in collaboration with Exegesis um, and the City of York Council and is funded by Historic England. And this talk will also be powered by LEMSIP. So <laughs> please bear with us. Um, <laughs> I'm assuming I can just scroll through with the arrows on the keyboard. Yes. Excellent. Okay, so where are we at um, in terms of a deposit model for the city of York? Um, well, I suppose that our conversations that have started, particularly for myself, um, really began nearly three years ago um, with the York Central project. Um, and some of the deposit initial deposit modeling we carried out as part of that um, program of development. And within that, we started to have some conversations with Claire um, and exegesis and just talking around really how data that is generated by deposit models, perhaps lying slightly separate to archaeological investigations, might be integrated more into the HER. Um, might be more accessible to non-specialist investigators. Basically, how can we use this data to its maximum potential? Um, there is a deposit model that exists currently for the city, the OVARP um, model, which as you can see here, is in paper form, um, which is great. Um, but some of the sort of what we would now call metadata behind the thought processes of quantifying and categorizing the deposits within that is, is somewhat become lost. Um, also, it only goes up to a certain point in time. So it doesn't really take into account um, modern investigations. It also doesn't include a lot of the BGS borehole data. So it's a really good starting point, but it's not really being used to its fullest potential. Um, and in the same way, the HER could be said to be the same because it does exist within the HER, but again, it's a very static 
thing and it's really hard to extract the information out of it in a usable way. So those are the sorts of conversations we were having with Claire um, and also um, just in unofficial conversations between other geoarchaeological deposit modelers. So myself and Virgil, um, even though we're technically competitors, um, there's enough work to go around and we like to have a good old jaw about the projects that we're working on. Because again, deposit modelers in geoarchaeology are kind of like snowflakes. We're all pretty unique. Our backgrounds are all slightly different and we approach things in slightly different ways. Um, so in terms of, sort of the project background, those are sort of some of the, the thoughts and ideas and, and things that were kicking around for a couple of years when we were thinking about how could a more unified citywide model be created. The wider context of that, so beyond York, um, with the release of the Historic England Deposit Modelling Guidance, there's been a real upsurge in the demand for deposit models as part of the commercial archaeological process in terms of planning applications. Um, so we've got all of this data suddenly becoming available. And again, it kind of sometimes sits separately to HER data. It might not be included in final archaeological reports. Um, sort of a, a project that was designed to sort of address this um, was the Battersea Channel project, um, which is another sort of um, historic England, um, Greater London initiative during the development of the Nine Elms area in Battersea in London. And again, you know, you're talking about a large city where there's multiple archaeological investigators, multiple archaeological units, um, different clients with competing priorities. Um, and the council were really keen that, that this opportunity wasn't missed to create a more coherent um, and cohesive understanding of the deposits at the site over quite a large area. Um, and the project was essentially designed to coordinate all of those different contracting units into a sort of overarching research framework for the development. That also included creating a sort of underpinning framework um, of deposits that everybody pretty much agreed were um, the standard lexicon for the site. And then all of their data was re-inputted into a central model to create one big cohesive model. And that's quite a feat considering, you know, you're talking potentially about between about five to seven different archaeological contracting units working on this project, you know, about three years, four years, um, over a four year period. So a lot of that data was being placed into the master deposit model it, it, almost in real time. Um, it also meant that in an area where you had waterlogged preservation, we could really target um, limited commercial resources in terms of things like paleo environmental assessments, um, targeted excavation. Um, and that's really where it sort of comes back to sort of relevance with York, because as we know, it's famous for its waterlogged archaeological deposits, also its paleo environmental record. Um, York also has quite a unique record of monitoring um, of boreholes. So we also, as well as all of those washing briefs and desk based assessments and archaeological excavation data, we have archaeologically monitored geotechnical boreholes. Um, so again, that's another sort of data source that, that is important, but it kind of sits separately to all the other investigations and it, it really needs to be pulled sort of more centrally into how we understand the deposits in York. Um, and again, that feeds into the fact that that borehole record and the HER data are a really un, sort of untapped resource. Um, so what does this mean in terms of how we create deposit models? Well, we start with the geological mapping um, and we start with that freely on, available online BGS borehole data. Um, and you can see on the screen, this is sort of what one of those BGS logs looks like. Um, it can be quite dry. <laughs> um, obviously the BGS uh, and all of the data that is, is held in their database, the aims of those projects are different to our archeological aims, but there's still useful data to be had within them, particularly when it comes to the underlying deposits for the more recent archaeological periods. So obviously we've heard a lot about the Roman stuff, but also the prehistoric stuff. That's the really difficult stuff to find in York. Um, using these deep borehole data, maybe we can start to prospect for it, find it in a more coherent way. So we take a look at this BGS borehole data. We enter it into what we 
um, uses a Rockworks database, which is just a piece of software um, in, essentially designed for the oil and gas industry, which takes that raw data. So in, in the case of the lithology, we would just take the data exactly as it is within a borehole record, an archaeological report, a watching brief report, and place that into the database. We have a second category of data, which is the stratigraphy, and that's our interpretation of those deposits. So that's where we try and pull out what we think these BGS logs are related to, particularly when we're talking about archaeological periods and human activity. Um, all of the data then is stored in um, the Rockworks database, which can, which can be exported as an Excel spreadsheet. So you don't necessarily have to have Rockworks to see the data in its raw form. And that sort of underpinning of both seeing the lithology and the stratigraphy separately means you can start to see the thought <laughs> process behind how you've interpreted that stratigraphy. So with this, we can make a preliminary model of the site. Um, and then that way, use it to either target areas to be investigated, identify those areas of waterlogging or not, um, and then basically carry out some field work and then use that data to update the model. And so that's the really important thing about any kind of deposit model is they're designed to be updated. They are not the reality of the site. They're just a model. So they're there to be tested. They're there to be improved and they're there to be updated. So it just basically presents quite abstract concepts in a simple visual manner. And also deposit models don't have to happen at the start of a project, they can happen part way through and they can also happen long after the excavation process has gone, gone on. So it's never too late to do a deposit model. Once we put all that data into Rockworks, here are sort of some examples of what gets kicked out on the other end. Um, and it has multiple functions of displaying the data. So that can either be in three-dimensional fence diagrams, like we see here, um, two-dimensional sections, and GIS surfaces where you can see the heights of deposits, where we can target those areas that might potentially be either in the high or the low ground. Um, and again, there are a multitude of ways of, of using this um, visualization technique just depending on your audience so it it really depends on asking the right questions before you start the model to get the outcomes and the visualizations that you were expecting and i'll hand over to virgil for the next bit all right let's go on um hi i'm virgil uh from oc archaeology um i'm just going to add in a few little bits about um Kind of how deposit models are used beyond what what Chris has already outlined, and then talk about how we're uh, how we're approaching the project generally. Uh, most archaeology uh, is concerned with with like man made deposits or features. As as geoarchaeologists, we're kind of you know, we're also interested in these deposits in that way, but more specifically in the processes by which they formed and and survived. Uh, buried land surfaces at kind of high elevations. Uh, would have been drier for much of the past and more suitable for long term occupation. So trenches and larger excavations might record, might be used to kind of record features such as ditches or pits in these types of areas, but finds are likely to be limited to materials that survive in these kind of less waterlogged conditions. So flint, bone, uh, metal artifacts, things like this. On the other side, uh, there are kind of points of interest like uh, waterlog deposits that we've already seen discussed in, in other talks uh, today. Uh, and this is where like past land surfaces uh, would have mostly been low lying. Um, here, boreholes might find the, the kind of the deep, thick deposits of uh, alluvial clays and peats and things like this. Uh, these deposits provide potential for good preservation of paleoenvironmental remains, as Chris has already mentioned, things like ancient pollen, things like that, um, to tell us more about the, the climate during those periods. Although less likely for long-term occupation, artifacts and structures made from kind of less durable organic material. So maybe like wooden jetties or leather artifacts uh, may survive in these, in these types of conditions. And highlighting the location of these different types of deposits and types of past landscape can help predict the, the, the nature type and importance of the remains that might be present. So, but, 
deposit models um, can do a little bit more than just highlighting specific types, types of deposits and their survival. Um, a process like this can help archaeologists with, with bigger questions um, about how deposit, basically trying to think about how deposit models help by placing a site in a landscape concept context or a landscape setting. Now, these uh, examples are quite broad uh, and vague, but I'm just bringing them up now um, before we kind of get into the more technical and, dare, dare I say, it, bland aspects of, of, of the project. Um, uh, so we can just keep in mind uh, what the what the kind of approach could ultimately tell us and how deposit models might help us to answer interesting questions and tell a more compelling narrative about the archaeology we, we uncover. So let's say archaeologists have um, uncovered two contemporary prehistoric sites. So early flint tool using uh, humans um, from like, say, three to 10,000 years ago for the um, kind of non-archaeologists out there. Um, the sites are, are, are near to each other, but are discrete activity areas. Maybe it remains of a hearth on one, maybe remains of uh, flint tool processing at the other. Uh, this information on its own already kind of uh, lends itself to discussions of uh, uh, people moving, moving seasonally across a landscape or separation between different tasks in the landscape. Um, looking at this schematic view uh, of, the, of the modern landscape, they appear to be situated in a similar kind of setting. But if we place these sites within their contemporary landscape um, and environmental context, we can see that they're situated on, on separate islands within a, a river complex. And that makes a big difference, let alone that these locations may have different access to different resources at different seasons. It also raises questions about how these communities potentially traveled between these locations. Did they have to cross open rivers or waterlogged marshland? If open river, they might have used canoes. If marshland, they might have built trackways. From these types of landscape reconstructions, we might even be able to target areas to look for these different types of remains. And these um, applications aren't limited to early human sites. Uh, the landscape has changed a lot, even over more recent periods. Let's give another broad example. Uh, medieval and post-medieval, uh, so again, for the non-archaeologists, a few, few hundred to a thousand years ago, um, foreshore sites, so river, riverbank sites, um, often have uh, many phases of river management or river defense. Uh, but why were there multiple phases? Um, was it because river levels uh, were rising and increased flooding meant that uh, revetments needed mending or raising? Alternately, were there population and settlement pressures? Were revetments part of expansion phases where valuable dockside space was increased by building out into river? Um, looking at deposit models and the site formation processes, we might trace the kind of changing river levels and, and flood deposits, suggesting the top scenario. On the other hand, we might see increased ground raising deposits and impact on environmental remains from expanding human activity, suggesting the primary drive was settlement pressure. So whether we're looking at far in the past or more recently, there are a lot of ways kind of deposit models might contribute. Yeah, back into the, the kind of spreadsheets a little bit, sorry. Um, refocusing back onto the project, um, it's, it's, it's planning to run for about two to three years. Uh, it's been split into two stages, the first stage over the first year and followed by the second stage over the subsequent time. Um, stage one uh, um, basically involves the initial steps of working with uh, exegesis to restructure the HP SMR so that it can house the data uh, that we want to put into it in a way that's effective for both HERs and deposit modelers. Um, so again, for the, the non-archaeologists, the, the HBSMR is uh, the Historic Buildings, Sites and Monuments Record. It's a database and GIS platform to kind of manage, analyze, and uh, present and publish heritage data. Um, the deposit data from a site will be housed in the, the deposit module within the HBSMR. Uh, so that it contains the information required by deposit modelers, and it's in a, fo in, in a format that can be easily used by deposit modeling software. Um, 
but it should also be in a format that's easily easy to understand by everyday HER users. As part of that, we have proposed kind of uh, keyword lists to kind of standardize the, the data to a degree. And these keywords lists exist for the lithology. So as, as Chris mentioned earlier, the kind of deposit description and the stratigraphy. So the kind of chronological interpretive groups we assign um, to it. Um, and you can kind of see, you can see some brief examples here, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna show you too many, too many spreadsheets. Um, because the project area encompasses quite a varied modern and ancient landscape, uh, two pilot areas were chosen to develop and test the system and the approach. Area one is um, the urban city center from Copgate to York Castle, and area two is in the suburban edge of the city near Napton in the west. Uh, we had already anticipated some of the different challenges between the areas. Uh, it was likely that area one would have a greater number of data sources, whilst area two would be relying more on British geological survey data than archaeological reports. Uh, this may mean that the, the resolution of the models in the different areas is, is different. Conversely, models of landscape and archaeological layers are likely to be much simpler in area two than area one because of the basically because of the lack of data, but also the, the nature of the past activity in the areas. There's a, a lot more going on in the in the city centre. Um, and in addition, as, as, as Martin has mentioned, uh, information from the, the Roman York Beneath the Streets project will feed into the deposit data for this project. Within the pilot areas, uh, the data from the previous 1990s of Arup uh, model is being quality assessed and, and useful data transferred into the new data set. But the main aim of pilot studies will be to focus on data gathering from additional BGS and grey literature sources, so the archaeological reports. The BGS data is um, faster to input, um, but lacks that archaeological detail. Data gathering from the grey literature reports has been a lot more labour intensive, as detailed deposit data from representative sequences for the main um, uh, generally needs to be measured from um, from section drawings by hand um, and descriptions uh, searched for within the set within the the actual text a lot of the time um, these records should have the the archaeological detail but they we're finding quite a lot of them uh, lacking kind of accessible and accurate quantitative detail so depths and actual um, uh, detailed descriptions of the deposits but Chris will mention a bit more of that in a minute um, there's also uh, there's a number of review points set into the project just to make sure that the approach is kind of working and that the data can feed back and forward between uh, the deposit modeling and the HP SMR. Uh, ultimately, stage one will culminate in the production of the preliminary deposit models for the pilot areas and the kind of updated project design for stage two. We're about two thirds to a half kind of the way through the pilot areas at the moment. Um, and Chris is going to give a little summary of where we go. Um, so, as you've already sort of seen um, from both this project and Martin's Beneath the Streets project, what we don't want to end up with is two completely different models that don't work together. Um, so, as well as um, having the conversations with Claire, at the same time, almost we were having the conversations um, with Martin and his team in terms of what they required from a model. Um, so really these pilot areas um in this project are really important because they're going to help us hopefully iron out some of the kinks and the flaws in our either our data input processes um identifying the limitations of the data um but also telling us how long it's going to take to actually input this information and that's really important when you've got a time limited project so so far we've started with area two because it's smaller and it's easier um and as Virgil's already said, we you know fully expect that the some of the issues in area two will be the same as area one, but area one will be more complex because there is more data, there are deeper deposits to consider, and more layers to the archaeological record. Um, so currently, um, we've taken the area around Napton and 
started the preliminary sort of data cleaning um, and that's both from the BGS records and um, archaeological evaluations and excavations to see if we can create conceptual models across the area and to see if it actually works because obviously we've put these data categories and these strat stratigraphic keywords um, together but we now have to see if they actually work um, and the short answer at the moment is they don't um, but we kind of expected that um, and we kind of know why for area two um, and you can just about see um, the distribution of data across the area two area is really clustered you've got a really nice tight group down here a really nice tight group here we've got some bgs borehole data along the road and then not much else so the accuracy of the model is going to be determined by how many points the data is using over what distance so at the moment the model is trying to stretch this data point all the way over to this data point and so between those two points this area is probably going to be really inaccurate so at the moment we're working on ways of potentially constraining um, that area to pilot study area to maybe just model things in sort of almost in small areas sub areas of the main investigation area to see if that makes the model a more useful tool um i think none of us thought you know that it was going to be possible to model the deposits from city center to the rural zone in one giant model i don't think that's the point i think behind this this is what where the metadata becomes useful we have done a lot of work in terms of quantifying and, and doing quality control on the data we put into the model so there is a lot more information available behind this other than the nice pretty pictures that might get kicked out of a deposit model so any other person undertaking studies in that area can take our data and see exactly what our thought processes were and then they can disagree or agree with them as they um, see fit they can also potentially use the same processes and procedures in their own model so we create some sort of coherent way of doing things within the city um and as Virgil said, you know, and, and Martin sort of alluded to um, with Thomas going through some of the data for the Beneath the Streets project. Um, we are looking at BGS borehole data, but we're looking through um, excavation reports, watching brief reports, all those sorts of things. Um, and I think what we're all coming to realise is that a lot of the archaeological reports are beautifully written pieces of prose and they tell a really lovely story. But as a technical report of which you can extract data from rapidly, they're just not really up to scratch. And there isn't really a split because we have this sort of discussion as, OK, is it a time split? Were things done better back then and not so good right now? Well, not really. Um, it, it can vary between author. It can vary between um, company. So there is a lot of variability, even within what we would hope would be a standard archaeological approach. That doesn't mean to say the data isn't useful in those reports. It's just not useful to us right now in the format that it's in. Um, so our sort of task, I suppose, with uh, from area two to area one is to see exactly how much time we're going to expend extracting that data from those sorts of reports. You know, how far down the rabbit hole should we go with this? And do we need to have a second set of processes and procedures to decide at what point we cut our losses trying to get data from a report and maybe mark it in, in a pile that is to be considered by someone else with more time. Um, but again, we're, we're only really just into the initial stages of, of area one. Um, so I think hopefully by January we should we should know that. And then that's really where our work with Martin's project will really begin. Um, and I think Virgil's just going to give you a bit more background on the area one stuff that we've been doing. Yeah, so area one again, the, the smaller bit in the in the city centre. Um, there are about three hundred and sixty-two separate HER events in the area, each re representing kind of an archaeological investigation or um, a, a deposit model point from the Ove Arab uh, deposit model from the nineties. Um, we split these into one hundred and eighty points in the north and one hundred and eighty points in the south, each for mm -hmm. basically each organization to kind of deal with and, and see see what we can we can get out of them. Um, 
as you can see, the actual, because the, the split is in the, the two different colors from north to south, uh, you can see that the, the data points in the north are actually quite a bit more dense than they are in the south. Um, in addition, there's about 96 uh, BGS points spread across area one. Um, the distribution isn't too bad. There's some notable kind of uh, uh, kind of clusters either along along rivers or along roads. Um, those have been really simple. We've we've input all of those into the into the data set already. They've been nice and straightforward. Um, the so far, the 180 uh, of the kind of event points that are in the south that um, uh, we've been looking at at AOC. Um, uh, they've produced about 121 deposit logs. Again, you can see like really distinct clusters, especially um, along that kind of like western western edge and eastern edge, where where you've got large um, or, or kind of large excavations or frequent development. Um, there's also uh, 130 points um, in there from the the 90s over Arab uh, uh, model. Um, and as this is uh, limited to kind of the, the southern part of area one, uh, looking at the data set so far from the OVA Europe um, deposit data, um, uh, it's, it's, it's probably going to be relatively difficult to relate that to, to known, known investigations. We might be able to trace the investigation, but we might not be able to trace what section it actually comes from um, and to get quantifiable, quantifiable sequences. But we're going to incorporate some of those where we can. Um, we don't have deposit models for this data yet, as we're still inputting and cleaning it. Um, uh, but at least this gives you a little bit of a preliminary idea about the, the types and spread of data. Now, um, the 121 kind of uh, deposit logs that we've compiled from the ATR event data so far has, um, have mainly been possible because of the, 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 the kind of wonderful web uh, portal maintained by York City Council that um, Claire mentioned earlier, which enables anyone to access the archaeological reports from the city. Uh, not all of the information is on is on there. It's um, like some of the older ones, they might not be entirely complete and some of the new ones they, they still need uh, putting on there. There's occasionally a backlog, but it's a great it's a great resource. Um, with that in mind, the, the kind of 121 logs that we've produced so 121 kind of uh, data points that we've produced so far have only come from some of the HR events. They haven't come from 121 HR events because because for the large sites, we're inputting a number of sequences from across a site in order to represent the variety of the deposits across that site. Um, yeah, and there's still a few there's still a few records that we need to need to track down either from their primary sources or from the original archaeological organizations that undertook the work. Um, now we've been quality assessing the data as we've gone forward. Um, there's like four broad questions we've been asking to do with whether it's got um, uh, numerical elevation, numerical location data, uh, numerical depth, or detailed deposit descriptions. And, and basically, as we input the data, you have to ask, answer yes or no to these questions. And then using, using the number of yeses, a nice, simple way, it, it can give us a, a, a quick uh, um, uh, assessment of, of the basically effectiveness and quality of the data. So if it's got four yeses, it's high, it's got, it's got great, um, great location information and detailed descriptions. If it's got no yeses, then, then basically it's, you, you can't work out where it's from and the, the deposit descriptions are really vague. Um, why is it important to track the data quality? Well, we know there are issues with the data. In order to effectively use the data, we need to be fully aware of the issues. Um, but we also need to understand those issues in order to kind of improve the data for the future so that um, the, the data that may be going into archaeological reports in the future or into the HR, uh, HR in the future can actually be useful to um, deposit modelers if it needs to be. So a system like this helps us do it more rapidly. Um, now, we've been talking a lot about stage one, a quick overview of what's going to happen in stage two. Um, stage two will be kind of spread out to the, 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 the red outline around uh, the wider kind of city. Um, it's assumed that the approach will, will broadly follow that of stage one with some, with some potential changes. Um, as we said, uh, we might we might not get all of the 1990s Obey Arab 
deposit data into the deposit model, but we'll at least be able to produce outputs that can compare the two data sets. Um, the final deposit model outputs will be produced and disseminated through seminars and workshops, and we hope the outputs will be accessible on map-based HR web systems. Uh, but the details of a lot of that are still to be decided during the updated project design. Um, uh, from the new data set and deposit, um, and deposit model, we aim to produce plots of important strata showing their surface elevation and thickness, uh, topographic models showing the surface of the Pleistocene or glacial deposits are often used to represent the early Holocene topography, so kind of 10 to 12,000 years ago, uh, and this enables us to reconstruct the basic landscape at the start of the early prehistoric, uh, but we hope to include layers for alluvial and organic deposits overlying this and more period specific uh, layers for archaeological horizons. Um, there's a here's a, some examples from uh, um, from like uh, uh, early bits of I think York, York Central and other projects and and we saw in in Toby's talk earlier how these can be applied and how useful these can be. Um, and this information can give rise to kind of designation of areas of archaeological potential, which helps to more effectively manage uh, buried heritage assets, as well as targeting uh, research and commercial archaeological investigations. Uh, for this project, uh, we specifically think um, potential maps for preservation and truncation will probably be quite useful to overlay with the deposit model, as well as maps where recent archaeological information is lacking, but could still survive. Uh, and I'll try and blast through this last bit. Um, we believe these outputs will be invaluable uh, for kind of informing future research aims and uh, basically bring that the, the, the kind of groundbreaking stage that um, uh, the, the York deposit model in the 90s kind of gave to uh, gave to the HER, kind of bring bring the York HER back to that, that, that level. But we also really want the information to be more accessible online and more interactive for both other professionals and the public. Now, I said earlier that uh, we're partway through the project, so we've only got a minimal data set so far. However, I'd like to kind of end by talking just about how this project fits into the wider context of kind of deposit modeling for, for HERs. Um, back in the 90s, of course, there was the Ove Arup report um, uh, deposit model that we've already kind of talked about. Over the last 10 years or so, there have been a number of other attempts at similar projects. And this slide just quickly kind of shows examples of those. Um, in the last year, uh, I led a project for Historic England that intersects quite closely with the York project. We reviewed the approaches and successes of deposit models used by HERs. Um, a questionnaire went out to uh, HERs uh, through Historic England and Algeo and held and we held interviews with select HERs on it. And then we ran a workshop with HERs and deposit modelers to talk about the issues. Um, Within this re review project, the York City deposit model um, is views, viewed as an approach to follow. It's a good example of how to structure a system and, and vice versa, the kind of recommendations of the, the Historic England project, the review report are also being rolled into the York project. So they're very much working in tandem and overlapping. Um, it isn't to say all HR should do the same thing. It's very much a, a, a kind of, um, we, we know there's a, a great diversity in the, the types of areas that HRs are looking after. So they're, they're, they're kind of systems do need to kind of fit their, fit their needs. Um, the research report for that earlier project should be coming out soon. Um, the final chapters are really aimed at kind of uh, helping HR professionals uh, through the process of thinking about using deposit models in their systems. Um, and the next step, basically, when we get to the uh, updated project design part of, York of the York City deposit model project, it'll be an opportunity for both of those project teams to kind of come together and discuss the further development and dissemination of, of, um, of either more detailed uh, uh, more detailed advice, like uh, guidance for HRs uh, about this, guidance for contractors, uh, resource hub for HRs and deposit modelers, and that that kind of idea of, of a minimum lexicon uh, for deposit modeling in HRs. Um, 
the York City deposit model is likely to form a kind of basis for a lot of these recommendations. So it'll be quite exciting to see how it develops as it as it moves forward. And I don't know if you've got anything to add. Um, I just think, yeah, if we don't both have a nervous breakdown trying to do it, um, I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic results. So um, if you're praying for Martin, pray for us also. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to Martin, Chris and Virgil uh, for the uh, two talks. So we've got time quickly for some questions for all three. Uh, if you'd just like to raise your hand if you've got a question. Uh, Mark Simpson, I've got a question for Martin, if possible. Yeah. Grand. Um, the, the, the idea of doing it, the database for, for York yeah. sounds fascinating. Um, once it's sort of done, or mostly done, is there any chance of expanding it further, like to the towards the south? Because uh, I live a little bit south of Selby. I'm involved with a lot of local groups around Selby yeah. and a lot of the community groups. I was talking to Paula earlier about the, the map dig at Balby, which is just north of Selby. There's also the Usendowink community um, uh, project uh, that are also working with uh, Roman and Iron Age remains. So is there a chance of uh, expanding it in future? Um, well, Thank you. I very much hope that it will be the sort of thing that other people will want to expand elsewhere. Uh, in the nature of our funding, uh, it is time limited and space limited. Uh, that's what we agreed to. But I do think that these sorts of uh, projects of integrating data so that we can review it and move forward are absolutely fundamental for British archaeology. Questions? Uh, just a question for Martin. I'm just wondering where the database is going to be, um, what source it's going to be provided from. Is it going to be from the ADS or Cambridge? No, or? It's, uh, it will, when we're done, it feeds back into the uh, City of York HER. So uh, the idea is we, we update. We will have a an archive that will be on the Cambridge University digital repository at Cambridge University Library, but the active use of it is through uh, Claire and the HER. That's it's a public benefit job. That's the idea. I think there was somebody had the hand up over on that side, Gail. Thanks, Martin. Just a quick question. Will it become um, will it be renewed and revised as new information comes along in future years, or will it be very much a static database? Well, when we're done, we're done. I think there is then a question for organisations like Historic England is to how we keep uh, HERs and so forth up to speed. And I know it's something that Claire feels... <laughs> Do you want to comment on that, Claire? Not <laughs> no. really. <laughs> Not publicly. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a generic big problem uh, that uh, it's to do with resourcing local authorities. Question, question to Martin. Uh, the, um, what, uh, on the, what is the timeline for the proposed uh, public participation in your project please um, i might have been not paying attention so you might have already said um helen uh, your archaeological trust is i hope uh, we i've just signed off the volunteer handbook and i think we're going live with it um in the new year but uh, uh, you can always email me i'm on the Cambridge University website, Faculty of Classics. And if you email me, if you're interested, I'll make sure your interest is passed on. Any more questions in the room? Well, um, thanks for, uh, thanks for, Thanks to uh, Virgil and Chris and Martin um, for speaking in this uh, after lunch slot. Uh, there should be some fresh tea and coffee out at the back. And then, um, yeah, at what time What time did I say it come back? Uh, we're starting again at um, 
well at 22 but we'll be we'll be starting prompt at 22 so a quick 20 minute break or so tea and coffee at the back stretch your legs thanks <laughs> <laughs>
So welcome back again. We've got two final talks um, and then you're free to go. <laughs> but thanks for staying with us uh, to this point in the day. So the next uh, speaker is Stephen Gandolfi from the City of York Council. And he's, he is our um, City Walls uh, manager who started earlier this year. So um, he's probably a new face to many of you. But um, yeah, so I'll let Stephen take over. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around today. Um, yep, my name's Stephen Gandolfi. I'm uh, the City Walls Manager as I started in, on the 25th of April this year. And my responsibilities really are the care, repair, enhancement and celebration of, of the City Walls and associated scheduled monuments, so the ramparts and, and some other bits and bobs that are just off the City Walls. So today I'm just going to talk about the work that we've done since I've landed um, in April. And the starting point should be the reference to the uh, November 2021 uh, conservation management plan that was adopted, which is a 550 page document, which is basically a, a little bit of a heritage significance document and the condition report and the condition report really uh, alongside work from our framework, uh, framework uh, engineers mason clark dictate what projects uh, conservation projects that we do along along the city wall and that's available to download on on the council's website this is just an, an example really of what the condition uh, survey in the report looks like this is a section um, booth and bar and it just really does a traffic light um, type uh, analysis of, of the condition of the various elements of of each section so external masonry in, um, internal masonry etc so my job essentially is to color in the red and orange bits and, and turn them green So of course we 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 do a lot of smaller, uh, minor projects, which is just sort of the basic maintenance uh, with the council's uh, stonemason team, which we've got a, a, a team of six stonemasons and a labourer employed by the city of York Council. Um, you might see them dotted along the wall, and they're in their high vis orange uh, uh, outfits. Uh, but there, there's two a picture of two of the younger members of the team um, shaping a piece of magnesium limestone ready to be uh, put onto the wall in, in place of a, uh, a cracked uh, coping stone. Essentially the basic maintenance uh, is rebuilding the structural um, failing, the structurally failing elements of the walls, um, hacking out the uh, cementitious mortars and, and failing mortars and replacing them in more appropriate lime mixes, replacement of flagstones and, and sort of the general care and repair of the of the city walls. But where we get into a, a little bit more complex sort of building mm -hmm. conservation that really links to archaeology is when we start having to excavate into the rampart um, in order to understand the structure and why it's failing. So recently we did, and this summer, we did uh, a, a scheme at Tower 35, which really the, the aims of the project are up on, on the bullet points there, but uh, the aims were to, to dig free trial trenches beneath um, visible cracks within the wall walkway, um, rebuild the failed corner, of the Tower 35, which you can see on the left-hand side of the screen there. And then essentially establish if there's any further structural work required in this section. So this is just a, a piece of uh, photogrammetry that, that York Archaeological Trust did for us, which was really, uh, well, it's a nice visual to show where the uh, failings in the inner walkway wall are or were. Um, here's the return with the crack quite visible here. We have another crack appearing at this point. 
and probably you can't see it very clearly, but it, it does go in a V shape. There, there was a failing on, on there as well. So, uh, and then we had a third crack, which was here, which you can't really pick out, but we'll see it later on. But essentially this is what these trial trenches were for to determine why these elements uh, of the wall, walls were failing. So that's a shot of uh, the stonemasons and the, the supervision of, of a, a member from Yat. Um, I was very, I wanted the stonemasons to, to do a lot of the archaeological digging under the supervision of, of uh, Yat because I wanted them to, to understand the process. I think in previous years, they perhaps haven't been involved in, in, in archaeology, but I think it was very important for them to understand um, the, the significance of the rampart and then add their contributions to the, the failings of, of the wall because the archaeology helps tell the story of, of why the wall is failing and behaving in different ways. So in terms of the trenches, um, you should see at the bottom right of the screen is, is a little plan with the quite uh, a, a vulgar, uh, um, a vague um, sketching of where the, the trenches were but trench one was around the return in the walkway and the aim of of that trench was to determine what the foundations are for that section that's failing simply we found that there wasn't any foundations and uh apart from three 19th century bricks that have been wedged in um you might just be able to make them out but three 19th century bit bricks wedged in there and that's why it was failing it was a pretty simple solution really um in terms of taking out those stones setting them back in and leaving it as it is now to fail presumably in the future um but not very intrusive what we did find within that real shallow trench was a, and it was in the residual, so it wasn't within a context, but we, we did find quite a nice ring. Um, and <coughs> Ben Reeves and, and, and colleagues at, at YAT have, have informed me that it's Anglo Scandinavian in, in, in age. And uh, we hope to do a little bit more work on, on that and, and um, in the future to understand it more. But I think it's quite a nice piece and it's quite revealing that I think it was probably 15 centimetres below ground, 15, 20 centimetres. It shows you that within the rampart, there's a, there's a lot out there, um, not in context, so it doesn't really tell much of the story of, of this section of the walls, but all it, I suppose it tells us is that the Anglo-Saxon, uh, the Anglo-Scandinavian rings existed in York, but a uh, uh, nice find nonetheless. So this was the work that we did. We stripped out the, the stone from, from the return. Of course, under the watchful eye of, of Yat as part of a watching brief. And that's how we supported it. And that's, that's it uh, rebuilt before it was repointed. So I'd urge you to go and have a walk at some point if, you, if you're around the, the city and walking the walls and go and have a look at Tower 35 and see what the, the final version is with the, with the line pointing. We do expect it to fail eventually again, hopefully once uh, I'm long gone. Prince 2 um, was trying to look at this uh, V-shape cracking above. Um, and quite interestingly, the reason why it was cracking was because this section here doesn't have a foundation. And this section here has the foundation, presumably, of the other side of the tower that once existed with some of the medieval arch that comes in later on on this side. So it looks like the, 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 the wall is failing in a... In a uh, in a junction of, of, of foundation and a no foundation, which was quite useful. And if we extrapolate that to other cracks along this stretch, we can kind of guess where foundations may, may be, I suppose. This was trench free. We're seeking to reveal the presumed medieval arches that, that go underneath the walkway um, and right through the wall at this section. Um, I think historically it was quite a wet area, so it looks like they, they put arches in to support this, this section of the walls. Um, the key 
one of the key goals was to establish if this arch is still working as an arch and and what was beneath the arch was it historical packing or was it more recent 19th century packing i think we I haven't read through the report in great detail so i've just got it off the off, hot off the press but essentially um this pack in here the clear pack in uh, looks like it's it's medieval and, and and contemporary with the certainly the initial clay in the rampart so it looks like this arch was built and then the rampart packing went through under the arch i'm not an archaeologist so <laughs> apologies for uh, some of the phrasing this was just a, a, a more detailed photogrammetry work done um, by Yat. I think it just shows the, the trenches quite nicely, actually, in the depths that we went to, including the, the arch. So we also do other smaller projects moving on. Um, this one was a repainting of the shield scheme. Um, we wanted to make Micklegate uh, look attractive in preparation for the Queen, late Queen's arrival as part of the, the Jubilee celebrations. Of course, she, she didn't visit uh, as part of those uh, celebrations, but uh, we, we did um, obviously get the, a visit from uh, the new king um, on the 9th of November and um, the painting and the gold leaf on, on Micklegate Bar. Um, looked quite nice, I think, when, when he arrived. Um, and and there's a, that was moments before he arrived in York um, last week or the week before. So this was more of a substantial project, the Micklegate Bar at Chainage 60, uh, 690 to 700. And the Chainages are just the little uh, numberings that we have along the walls, essentially, to identify each section. Um, the aims of this project was to address this quite um, concerning twist um, in, in the wall. Having consulted etchings and, and 19th century imagery from the last 250 years plus, it looks like this section has been altered a number of times and, and has been subjected to a lot of urban sort of change, um, including the um, insertion of these archways and the, the cutting of, of the rampart um, here to, to allow for the, the archway to go in and also for this urinal to be built in in the rampart itself. Um, so it, it looked like it was a problem that had been going on for, for a long time. So we got scheduled monument consent from Keith Emmerich at Historic England um, to take down the outer face of this wall right down to the rampart and rebuild to, to, to make stable. This is just the, uh, the conservation management plan showing that it was a, a red zone, if you like. So this is this is it as we were stripping the face off and, and throughout the process, we had Yat um, keeping a, a close eye on us. Uh, we had our uh, framework engineers, Mason Clark as well, conservation engineers advising on how uh, best to rebuild this this section of the wall. I think in terms of the building archaeology, the stones were probably cut a long time ago, probably medieval, but the wall wasn't medieval. It had been rebuilt many times. And to me, it looked like this might have been a rebuild in, in the 20th century because there was a lot of cement grout within, within it. Um, this image here, you can just see a hole, and that's the shop front of the pub inside of the Micklegate bar so really once we took we once we took the facing stones off the, there was a big void of where all the car had been washed out because of the inappropriate use of cement um, and we took out the stone on the inner side just to have a look and it shows that really this section of wall is only two stones deep um, at the same time we did a couple of trial trenches one on the outer rampart and one on the inner walkway and they were to establish, again, foundations. What are we working with? Why is it failing? Um, they both determined that there, are, there aren't foundations on this, this, this section. Um, and that's probably the reason, well, I think it is the reason why this bit of the wall was slipping down towards the road. So what we did is we took the face off and we 
didn't put a foundation in because that would have required significant excavation into a rampart. And as I'm sure a lot of you know, there's a lot of Roman stuff in there. Well Beloved talks about a mosaic not too far away from here and, and uh, that was found in 1814. Um, so we decided to put some, some larger magnesium limestone uh, from KB uh, quarry uh, and build off of, of, of that. Um, and we built it right the way up using lime, appropriate lime mortars. And at the moment, it's covered in hessian to try and protect it from the rain. Um, but it, it is, it's uh, all, all the stones are in the, uh, the same place as, as where they were. We numbered them all. Uh, we did insert some new stones where, where required. And that's just an image of, of uh, the Hessian on the king's arrival. <laughs> um, there was scaffold in there a few days before the king arrived, but we 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 finished the scheme just in time. Um, I made the call of, of keeping the Hessian up for the good of the wall as opposed to the aesthetics for the king. So. This was the trench on the inner walkway. Um, and Marina, we heard from earlier, she was one of the figures. Um, and these are some of the pieces that were found. I think we determined that the packing for the walkway was residual from, from elsewhere, probably close by, but um, I think the top one was Roman and, and, and the bottom piece was um, medieval, post-medieval, I think. But I haven't, we haven't got a report yet on that, so don't quote me. Uh, we found a piece of uh, grit stone as well, which is probably Roman uh, reuse. This was on the outer um, rampart, just here. And this was just to determine what the foundations were moving further along the rampart. Revealing here was that there was a cement pad below um, this buttress, uh, but no foundations again. So they're the projects that we, the big projects we've been doing since I started. Um, future projects, um, we want to re-roof the red tower. Um, the roof isn't of any uh, significant age. It's probably 1950s, 60s, but there are some earlier tiles on there. So we have sourced some replacement tiles from, a uh, new replacement tiles from Kima Tiles, which is a firm that's been going since 1588, I think. Um, and, and they are, have offered to do a day of demonstration of traditional tile making on site. So I'm working with uh, friends of, of, of York Walls and the Red Tower to, to put together a little uh, open day, I suppose, for, for conservation. Um, but this would this should take place in, in February, March time, um, the re-roofing of the Red Tower. So uh, keep a lookout for the open day. And we've had drawings done and scheduled monument consent granted, um, drawings done by our framework architects, Don Linsell uh, Associates. Essentially, we're going to insulate using breathable materials to make it a more pleasant space, um, meeting room on the upper floors. And we should be able to do that without causing any harm to any historic fabric, given that it's quite a, a, a recent um, roof. I've recently had a measured survey done for Booth and Bar. Um, the roof is in serious need of repair. Um, so I'm hoping to have a new roof design. And again, it's not, it's not a medieval roof. It's, it's a relatively modern roof. Um, and then hopefully, I want to have some, some stairs constructed there to allow access into the loft space, which could be open for heritage open days and that type of thing. I have also asked if a feasibility study could be done to have a look to see how easy it would be to get access or easy access to the roof of Booth and Bar, a lot more complex, perhaps too um, costly in, the, in these times. But if we could achieve something like that, the, the views from Booth and Bar are, are, are quite remarkable. That's the view looking towards King's Manor. The other view, which I couldn't capture when I was up there because of the sun, <laughs> but um, the other view is obviously of the Minster. And they're just the drawings of measured surveys you probably won't be able to make out from there. They look good on a CAD model, essentially. So that, that's 
that's me done essentially. Um, that's some of the stonemasons. So if you do see them along the walls, just uh, say hello. They're not gardeners. They are stonemasons. Are very knowledgeable about the walls. Um, so say hello to them. Um, we started using that hashtag for nothing formal, but uh, I suppose I quite like it. Walk your walls. Um, and if you want to contact me, questions, uh, more detail about some of the slides that I've just really rapidly gone through. Um, feel free to email me. The web pages for the city walls on the council's website uh, are coming soon. The revised ones are coming soon. Hopefully each uh, report for each section of the wall will have um, the report from Yat or, or from Mason Clark attached so that you can download them and, and read them. Um, and then the HER obviously will have copies of those as well. But uh, if you need any references for any academic work or any uh, uh, to refer to, the, to this report, uh, this presentation, let me know and I can provide the, the sources and the photographs. That's me done. Thanks, Stephen. Hopefully that will give you a, a flavour of some of the uh, types of work that we are commissioning here at the council and uh, yeah, what's going on around the walls, basically. So our final talk uh, is Mark Douglas, who is the uh, Senior Properties Curator at English Heritage, and he's going to talk about um, the recent work at Clifford's Tower. Most of the point, yeah. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, You've got me for the graveyard shift, so please try and stay awake. I know it's been a long day and got some fascinating talks. Um, I'm going to talk to you, as I said, about uh, um, Clivers Tower, recent developments. We've been doing a, a, a really, really big, exciting uh, redevelopment of Clippers, cost £5 million. And it was a big, big opening on the um, April uh, this year. Um, basically, we've with the, there was a whole series of archaeological investigations as, as, the, as the thing went along. I have to say, um, nothing unexpected came up, thankfully. I mean, at one time, we would probably say that we, we, I didn't want to find anything. I'm really, you know, we did, but we didn't find the, the killer, the killer role. Okay, so uh, here we go. So um, this this project came about, and I, um, if, if I remember, I remember Simon Thurley, the great Simon Thurley, um, on site one day said to me, "Look, he said this is this is ridiculous. He kind of people doing this and paying to go to see Clivers Tower. It's a glorified. It would have been a glorified um, viewing platform, a bit like Bootham Park. <laughs> you, know, you could see a great view at the top of Cliv Clivers Tower, but you know, not much interest was shown in the tower itself. And of course, you, if you if anybody remembers it, he's a climb one of the, one of the staircases." Join, join the, the little walkway and, so, and then do what we call the Clippers Tower Shuffle, which was to shuffle around behind a lot of tourists. And you couldn't stop because there was only one, one walkway, there's one way system. Down the other side, you paid your nine quid, out you went. Basically, the simple, simple as that. Great views, not a great experience to go with. So, English Eric is all about experiences. And Simon Fairley, he was the man, and he said, Right, make it happen. So, um, a little bit about the history of the uh, of the of the of the, 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 the tower. I mean, I won't go into too much because obviously we're in York, nobody knows about Clivers Tower. But um, the 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 Manila site itself was built over one, yet another um, uh, Roman cemetery. So there's been there's been some finds for Roman for Roman cemetery there. And um, the first um, the first iteration of the tower itself. Was in the, uh, the 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 late eleventh century, um, just after the conquest, to 1068, 1069, um, William the Conqueror, um, on his way back down after doing a bit of harrying in the north, um, decided to build um, a castle at York. In fact, he built two castles at York: one um, on this side of the Ewes, which is on the east side of the Ewes, and one on the other side of the Ewes, which is right bang next to the city walls on the far side. Now, I'm reliably informed, York is the only town, apart from London, which has two castles. I don't, I'm not, don't care that that's true, but it may well be true. Um, so this, obviously, with, with a modern Bailey type castle, it was a, a Norman type castle. It was built of timber with a surrounding timber palisade or, or surrounding a Bailey on the on, on outside. And you can see the, 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 the general ski, side, oh, sorry, this, this thing, the general um, Layout of these things. These are a lot later, obviously, lately developed as we're talking about. But the general thing is a mot and a bailey um, in timber. 
Defend, with, with a, probably with a mort as well down on the other side of it. Um, this was uh, obviously subject to a few a, a few accents, and one of course with the terrible um, event of the eleven nineties, um, where the, the the Jewish population of York were was, were massacred and um, basically hauled up in the uh, in the in the wooden castle, and the castle was burned down. A replacement was dumped, was built after that, after that, and eventually in the uh, in the in the twelve forties, um, Henry the third ordered the building of a masonry castle. So we're not talking about the, the, the castle itself, plus the tower. So the tower is the tower is, is a, the, the tower on top of the, the quadrifold tower is a 1140s. Um, just quickly run through a few things. 11, uh, well, 1360, there was a massive flood in York, which led to the one side of the of the mot being damaged, which led to a structural defect, which still can still be seen today, which was only only rectified, essentially rectified properly in the ninth in, in the turn of the, of the last century. Um, by the seven, well, we've got the 1750s here. This is the the, the building of. The, the 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 courthouse and the and the prison in the on of the eye of York. So this this idea of the the, the administrative centre of, of York uh, Yorkshire itself, you say the eye of York, being um, carried on in the, in the tradition of the, the castle itself. Um, this is the the hall, the debtors' prison, the the court, the law courts, the women's prison, and the 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 the, the surrounding walls in the 1800s. And then in 1824 to 1835. The whole thing was sort of like prison. It was a great big prison built around the whole thing, um, uh, with the, the governor's house over here somewhere. Because it was the casket and, a, and, a, and a, a huge perimeter wall around the whole thing, um, which a lot of people didn't realise until we, we we sort of well, I didn't realise to be honest with you until, until a few years ago that it actually happened. Um, but that that was taken again. That that was there until. 1935, when the whole thing was swept away again, and then Clitus Tower was revealed. There were some interesting stories in that, and some interesting things came up in the archaeology. Um, there's a nice picture of the uh, of the of the of the tower at the, the time when the prison was built. I'm sorry, it's a bit grainy because it was taken from a, a PDF, but you can see this is the interesting part. This wall, as well. So to 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 accommodate the the, the size of the mot within the in the in the the, the circle of the prison. They had to narrow the oh, sorry to reduce the diameter of, of the mot itself. So they basically cut it back, and almost like it's so the, the basic the, by ninety by ninety eighteen thirty, the 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 mot on which which on which Clitter Tower sits almost looked like a cake in the top of a cake tin, a surrounding cake tin. So that was that there. You'll, you'll see in the picture in a second. Um, now then, the the proposition. To increase the, the visit, visit expectation, the visit, visit their um, appeal, and of course, the, 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 the reveal properly to the public what a, a marvelous monument this is, was two things. One was an internal staircase, an internal stairway which allowed you to get back to the levels of the of the tower that had never been used before. So, never been used since the the fire of uh, uh, 1684. St. George's Day, 64, there was a massive explosion. The town people cheered. There was a great big firework display in the, in the, in the sense of um, gunpowder barrels going off. And uh, yeah, and there was nothing left. Um, and and the nothing, certain, certainly the first floor area, other than the, the staircase that taken to the chapel, it's on the front of the floor building, um, it were completely closed off. You couldn't see them. But now you, this was the plan was to bring those areas back into life. Um, and there was also um, a controversial. Uh, <laughs> Um, proposal to build a visitor centre into the to, into the, the, the base of the mot, which um, was 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 slowly uh, eroded by um, opinions, and initially decided that best thing to do was not to bother anymore and concentrate on the stuff inside. So there was two things there. One was needed to combine this project with a. Um, Full condition report on the on the on the tower itself. It's mostly it hadn't been touched for, for an awful long time, and it was full. I've been seen about in, in the city walls as well. It was full of cement mortar. We, we won't get the detail, but cement mortar is not the best thing you can have for a historic building. It wants to be hacked out, taken out, and replaced by a line, which allows allows the, the wall to breathe. But we'll go got that uh, some of the time. Um, so a full survey was done. We we, we employed the, the services of a, um, a, an architect. Called Hugh Broughton, who was a, a renowned architect in London, and a conservation architect called Martin Ashley. And Martin and his colleagues 
uh, his colleague went round and he tapped every single stone from, from a, sc a set of scaffolds and marked every stone down on these drawings like this that would be too too help help them aid in their and the repair works and similar to what we see seen with city walls that was exactly what we did um some stone rep replacement some stone um repair but also that that there was an awful lot of um interventions by the the minister well, the office of works and the ministry of works most of the office of works but the office of works was pre-1944 ministry of works um and uh, we'll see in a second what they were like, but they, they we will find is if you go, if you ever go to Clivers Tower, which I'm sure some of you will, you'll find that all the interventions or most of the interventions that were done by the Office of Works were done in gritstone. So they, they differentiated between, between what you could see that was medieval, plainly medieval, and what they had replaced. Some of that had to be worked out as well, and there, were, and there was also there were several structural defects still. Um, <clears throat> there's a nice picture of the castle. <laughs> and the prison. And you can see this the extent of that prison. It's incredible. I think to think about that was that's gone, completely gone now. Not, there's not a bit of it left. In fact, the only part of that prison you can see is um, I believe there's a there's a fireplace in a pub near Fishergate um, that was that was that was kept. The rest of it was sold off. There was a big sign outside. This is the um sorry, I guess tether. That's the one of the one of the main entrances. You could pay to go into the castle. Um and you can still go in, you can still pay to go in, into the court law courts and pay. Um, we used to have deer wandering around here and, and, and ravens flying about, apparently. I, I wanted to bring back the ravens if they wouldn't let me. Um, the deer probably wouldn't survive. we walk off. But there's, uh, yeah, so you could actually make your way through the Eye of York. The prison's inside there with this central panopticon, sort of, this, this is so central hall and the, the execution sheds on the other side. They won't show them. Um, but you'll pay to go in. And you'll also enter this little doorway and up and up a spiral staircase. Well, sorry, up a, a winding path that would take you up into the into the into the, the, the tower itself. Um what oh yes I was gonna say but there was a site at the corner that basically sold this they said wood and stone for sale you could at the time you could go and buy some sort of stone. Um, this is part of the wall of this the wall here look this is the part of the wall I was telling you about. So look at these little kids see how massive wall it was the, so the, the last illustration did do it justice. I mean it, it was an absolutely colossal thing. This is, again it's all grit stone all the prisms grit stone where the rest of it this is all limestone. So what we did, what, if you imagine we're going to try and fit this, this uh, staircase and landings and roof inside that building, what we didn't want it to do, we didn't want it to rest on the tower itself. So what, we, so what the, the architect came up with was a, um, a, a basically a, a foot foundation, a massive foundation um, inside of the tower itself, which would entail lifting the floor of the tower putting a concrete foundation in, and then four legs supported on that on that thing, on that foundation. So basically, the top of the, the staircase and the roof would just sort of basically kiss the building. It was just slightly caressed the top of the building, so no pressure whatsoever on the building. But we had to do some some several things to, to, to make sure it was going to work. One was to find out how the structural stability of the mound. So we did some core, core work. I'll see this the result out in a second. And we also had to look at the what was down the bottom. And I suspect this was going to be the case, and it actually was. When they took the, the, the soil off the, off the, the top soil of the bottom of the mot, um, we found that the whole thing had been rejigged and reprofiled by using the prison. So this is the prison that was demolished in 1935. Um, basically, you know, the, the, this circular pyramid structure. Took, it took a little bit of the top of the wall down, I have to admit, took a wee bit of the top of the wall down, and then built the whole thing up the side there. And then um, then just reprofiled the whole thing. Clever, really, to be honest, because we've got, got into some on that stone they wanted to sell. And in fact, there we are. There's the this this site, you see, there's the wall itself being being slowly revealed. Um, just to check what was going on. Check out we had to check how thick the wall was, which was it was about a meter and a half thick, um, and what condition it was in, which is an extremely good condition too. And of course, then we put it all back. If the, the if the oh, excuse me, if the the uh, the, pr the proposal for the, the visitor center at the bottom of the model, of course, that would have all come out and that would have formed the back wall, but as it was, it didn't need to. Um, we also did some core sampling or boreholes uh, as part of the, as part of the uh, the proposal, just to make sure that the actual the model itself was um, 
well, two things. One, but the Archaeology was certainly the model itself was, was, was structurally stable to take, take the weight of anything. And it turns out there's a probably, I don't know, there's, there's, there's people who know better than I do, but apparently there's, there's some kind of like scale from one to 10 being one being really solid and 10 being really sort of like jelly. Clifford's Tower probably was, probably was number eight. But I think it was the, the circular, circular wall that was around, it was holding it all in. So you couldn't actually compress it down. Um, and I just think you can just, well, we'll go through the whole thing there. We said one of the, one of the conclusions from the report that was written about the, uh, about the boreholes was that it looks appears the man was simply um, excavating piles of material from a, um, the, the Roman cemetery and piling it up. So because there was at one point, there was, a, there, was a, there was some thought that may well have been built on an existing burial mound, a big mound. It turns out that's not the case. One of the issues, one thing Dills had found out, which is on the, on the slide, was that the, um, the the medieval, the early medieval, the earlier medieval um, post-conquest uh, mot was about eight metres lower than the one that's there now. So uh, yeah, those deep, I mean, we have those, we have that, have that report. Um, yeah, so there, that was, um, this is some of the earlier interventions. And this was a, by, by a great man called Basil Mott in 1902. Um, I think they picked him not for his, uh, his technical abilities, but more for his thoughts of laugh of a, of a bloke called Mott, you know, working on this, like Dr. Death. Or something. Um, and Basil was uh, <clears throat> concerned that the, the structural defects that, the, the, that appeared in the, in the tower in the 14th century were still there. Basically, this part of the castle, part of the tower, I should say, this side here was effectively just falling, falling up, peeling away. And he's still going now. You walk the staircase inside, you still feel as if you're going to, you know, you're going edge. Um, so what, what he did, this is an astonishing piece of work that these guys did in the, 19, in the early part of the 20th century, is they excavated from this point right round to this point on the, on, on well, excavated trenches in this one, two, three, four trenches and basically filled in with concrete behind the retaining wall and up and underneath the tower itself. And so these, these four massive, massive flying buttresses that, 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 that span that space and hold the thing up to what's why it won't fall down. And at the same time, they also did some work inside of the tower. The tower is basically full of trees and, um, and you know, and picnic benches and a little, sort of little, little brick building at the time. Um, clear it all out and pull all the drainage in so stop and get the water away from the top of the mot as well to, keep, to try to improve the stability. But that's Basil in his work. I think it's um, it's pretty pretty amazing. But also um, Mott uh, looked at some of the some of the makeup of the, of the mound at the same time, which um, sort of pops, you know, it it, it 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 sort of matches what we found. This black soil and stones layer seems to be the layer that we that was that was thrown up from the uh, from the, ex from the excavation of the cemeteries. Oh, by the way, there was one small piece of bone in the cemetery in the in the in the course for the, the cemetery wall. Um, so there we have two things. This on this side is the, the staircase that goes up from the from Tower Street to up to the mot, top of the mot. Here is one of Basil Mott's concrete buttresses. And here, which we didn't know about, is a, a, a section of wall that looks like there was two limestone walls that ran up the original. You know, medieval 14th south or 13th century, um, the limestone walls that, that flanked the staircase that would have been there then, and the, and the, the latter part of the staircase um, in the 14th century. So we looked, looked there was there was a, there was a nice a nice survival, and of course all this stuff is backfilled and survives on the site. Um, oh yeah, this was another um, interesting, <laughs> another interesting <laughs> uh, find. If you go in the tower, the very back of the tower, there's there's, there's a there's a, a a, a guard rope. There's two doors at the bottom, two doors at the first door level. That's that that space has never been accessed other than by pigeons since 1684 when the hunger burnt down. Um, and what it is is a, a, a double a double guard rope. Sorry, a double door guard rope. So it looks like in the the original design of the of the tower there was accommodation for two people. And that's, it was never a royal accommodation, but that's the, what the sort of the idea maybe it would have been at some point. So two households at one at one point, a male and female household, with with um, access to two doorways that took you to one toilet. So we're scrimping on the toilet, but the, the, you know the, the to door is okay. And this is the toilet. Um, this is the, the, this one was first cleared out of pigeon guano and bits of rubble and bits of um, plant material, and we found this um, where the seat was. You can see there. 
the shaft going down, which goes down the back of the, the tower, which, you know, at the top of the mound. And this intriguing little slot that goes up and then up this, up this thing here, which is like a little, sh a little shaft that goes to the roof, almost like a little chimney. Now, what this was known about, but nobody ever seen it. We knew, we, you know, we all knew this, this thing was there. It was all about, is this, as you can see, is this a, um, it's always been suggested this was a, a, a medieval flushing toilet, right? Which is, which is pretty extraordinary if it is. I don't think it is. Um, so that place, we, so we did a good look at it. We got, got in there, there was all idea to look at, we did paint something, couldn't find any in there, couldn't find any of the third was here. Nothing like that was was, was visible. Um, not Nothing, it's just basically a dirty space. So, we, so it was all cleaned up, new grill put in. Well, I think here's a, a nice little cupboard where you keep your toilet duck and such like, you know, the, the blue brush. Um, and then when we finally took the roof, the, the the whole of the, 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 the top of Clifford's had a massive concrete ring beam on the whole, around the whole top. That We had to look at that and to have a good look at it and make sure it was in good order and good nick. It turns out it really was. It was going to be a disaster to get it out. But we did find that the hole at the top there, where, they, where it came out in the, on the walkway, the medieval walkway, and I personally believe, that, you know, I could be shot down, I could be shot down for this by many people. I don't think that's a flushing mechanism. I think it's a urinal. I think you're on the you know you're on the top of that thing. You're looking out over York. Of course, shop. There we are. And these things exist. The urinals exist. Flushing toilets don't exist. The urinals exist all over. Like that's, I think that's a urinal. But there's many people just agree with me and probably you know will fall out about it. But yeah. So but then but the best part is you can actually visit that space now and look for yourself. It's great. Oops. Excuse me. Let's go back again. Um, this was the archaeology that took place. Now the archaeologists. Um, not into the actually strange enough, was uh, we, we employed were, were fast field archaeology specialists from down in Fulford. I should have put that logo on there. I should have put a bit better about that. Um, and they did a fantastic job, marvellous. They, they watched all the all the watching for the uh, calls for the, the, the boring was done by auction briefs. They did the initial, initial trial trenching inside the tower. They also did this um, strip, uh, strip um, and record excavation down to a depth of 400 because that was the thickness of the of the concrete that went in, um, and basically found almost very, very, very little, to be perfectly honest with you. They found three dog burials. It looks like the burials were more likely when the when the, the tower was in the garden, Mr. Ward's house, which is down near where um, uh, Fairfax house is. Um, Mr. Ward's house, so it was probably, that, that was probably the, the time. Um, they found a small brick, Platform looks like there's a brick 18th, 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 late 18th, 19th century building in the garden building of some description. No, have no foundations for a central tower, which we thought there might be, but that's, that's been rubbed out. The whole thing being rubbed out by Basil Mott, damn his eyes, um, took the whole thing out and left it behind a little tiny depression, which I'm sorry I've got a photograph of, with the things he sort of thought were worth keeping, which were with a coffee pot, some bits of residual sort of medieval pottery, um, a couple of bones, and, uh, and I think there was a bottle of some description just should be a little, a little hole in the uh, in the side there but um nothing nothing would be excess just lots and lots of drainage except you won't be remembered cast your mind back in the center of the, the clearest tower there was this strange octagonal um on the first was this completely flagged floor at one point when we when i first started and in the center there was a, a big octagonal uh platform about about 30 centimetres high, and it was all suggested that was the, 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 the evidence for a central shaft that would have held the floor of the medieval of the medieval um, the medieval building. Of course, no such thing exists. It was just a complete made up thing by the ministry or the officer works and the night that well, there should be something there. Well, put something there. That's, so that's what they did. They, they, so you've got to be really careful with those guys because we're so good at the stone masonry and it's such a long time, you think, oh, it's just it's medieval stonework, it's being repaired by the ministry, you know. Um, what we did find, however, was, and it's, this is something we talked earlier about digging a tree up, we did find a tree, almost a tree, this huge, 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 huge um, section of bulk of timber set into the ground, surrounded by lead. If you look, <laughs> if you look on this picture, <laughs> this is the thing which, which has various names, I think it's been called the Big Whopper at one point in the past. Um, and it was just a, just a gigantic, enormous, ridiculously huge flagpole that stuck out the top of Clippers Tower. Um, and uh, it, was, it was so big, it was supported by chains on, on, on four sides. And this is the bottom of the flagpole. And that's what it is. That's, there's the big whopper in his, um, in his, in his kind of like lead-lined socket. 
And you also, if you look on this picture, you'll see there's the war coming in. Um, this was a later war, but it's it, it than the than the the war that caused the moth back. This is the one that separates the uh, the Eye of York from the from the um, from the prison, and we'll see that again in a second. So further, uh, go. Oh, oh, there we are. There's the uh, half a dog, unfortunately. But he's better preserved than some of those, those skeletons over the railway, right? But um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot wet at the time. The top of there is over there. But yeah, there he is. Well, we're not quite sure where the rest of it is. He's truncated by Basil Mott's, um, Basil Mott's uh, drainage works. Um, and there's Mr. Ward's house, which we assume this dog once laid by the fireplace in Mr. Ward's house. It's a nice thing, nice thought, isn't it? And there he is, rest, rest in peace on top of Clifford's. Um, the archaeology work. Um, like I say, it went really well because there wasn't any, which is which is fantastic. I promised Keith Emmerich there wouldn't be any. I promised DCMS there wouldn't be any. <laughs> Got myself hot water. Um, but as all good things, uh, you know, happen to, to to those who worked, um, bad things happened to me. And the um, it was Yorkshire Water. Yorkshire Water said, uh, from a standpoint of saying, didn't really matter. Then turned around and said, yes, we need attenuation because they wanted more water to go in the ooze. And I said, well, we don't put a roof on it. We've got the same surface area, but no, we wouldn't have it. So we had an attenuation tank had to be built, which is the worst possible thing I could think of because it was out, obviously outside. It was under the entrances at the bottom of the mud. It was on possible raw deposits, possible... Um, uh, ditch fill for a, for the for the mop for the for the the, the moat that went around the, the there could be anything in there you know there was there was there was, there was even possibly there was the, the years ago there was a, a suggestion there was a, um, a a prehistoric burial that was found next to the mop it may well have been one of these Roman burials that were shoved into a hole I don't know but um so it, it was it wasn't a, it was a bit of a unsettling thought that finally that when we get towards the end of a project suddenly we could find some serious archaeology and it would be hold us up it would cost money and nobody wants to dig it up really if you can leave it in position you know nobody wants to do that um so we I got the uh, uh again made an application for scheduled monument consent and uh, to deal with this so that was duly given um and a fast went to work on this um, it was it was basically we managed to rather than dig one big deep hole for the attenuation tank, I managed to convince them we'd have a, 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 a series of attenuation tanks that were a bit a lot a lot less depth. So they went down about a, a meter, a meter at the most. Um, and again, didn't find anything. That is the foundation of the wall on the other side there. That's the foundation of that wall there. That's it. A brick, a brick covering one question sure exactly what that was, but it, it seems. No, on, on retrospect, there's a five meter deep um, sewer that runs through just beyond there, and I think in by digging a five meter deep sewer pit, you've gone a lot wider and just took everything out. But also, when we we took, like, if you trust your mind back to the pictures I showed you of the wall itself when we excavated it, um, it the ground level itself has risen by at least one point two meters. So that wall that you could see in that in that picture is actually goes below ground by 1.2. So that the whole thing was built up. So we so we 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 made, we made those calculations. I mean, we 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 said, yeah, we think this would be okay, but you know, we can never be too sure. But thankfully, again, um, for the archaeology's sake, there was um, there was nothing there. So that was that was something you pleased with. So um, so basically, the tower got uh, a full restoration in terms of if it's if it's uh, stonework, and we, we did that. It got a full, um, a full sort of survey, and now it's it's it basically there was more work done at Clifton than actually was needed. We prioritised the works um, for all of our sites, but we said this, this Clifton's got one chance. We're going to do it all now. So it's basically I had everything done to it. Um, the thing I didn't show, but I should have actually put a picture. The fall building itself was also coming away um, from the it was peeling away from the from the tower. Um, and in the 1930s, they put in a, um, a, a, a wooden structure inside, a tie beam inside the, the chapel, inside the, the fall building on the first floor, and then tied the whole thing through with steel rods. <coughs> um, that was really odd because the, the chapel itself was on an angle like that, but they put the, put the, 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 the ring beam in it absolutely perfectly level. So when you walked in, it you, you, you got this weird kind of sensation. It was something wasn't quite right. Um, but as modern dimensions went and modern materials, and modern uh, conservation techniques, we basically were able to take that out, take the whole thing out. Um, strangely, they'd, they'd put this timber against the wall and poured cement down the back of it. 
But luckily, August or Betty peeled off the wall. You can't see it was there. The pigeons are really grumbling. There's nowhere for us to, to, to sit. Um, but then we put syntax anchors into the wall and anchor the whole thing back and put little blocks of limestone as you can't see them. It's all a lot, a lot neater, a lot better. We also, um, a bit like we told of the Red Tower, um, we use chemo tiles to, uh, to, do the, to do the roof as well. Uh, the roof of the, of the, that was a 19, I think a 1980s uh, replacement roof. So we take, took it off and put new roof on. Um, so yeah, so so Clifford Tower is, is looking splendid. And say in terms of uh, in terms of an archaeological uh, report, I, I do feel a bit of a fraud because it was interesting, but not not it's not it's not groundbreaking breaking archaeology, is it? Unfortunately. Um, but uh, oh, there's the finished project, um, or almost finished. And there's Hugh Broughton, the architect, looking very pleased with himself. I'm sure he does, and he was, and uh, it was a remarkable thing. And for once, I, I will say that. I've been involved. I've been involved with lots and lots of different projects in the last sixteen years. From this year, it's the best one I've ever been in, involved with. It was the most satisfying thing to be involved with something like this because what it did, it did what it said it was going to do. It was going to bring this tower to life, which is a bit of a cliche, but it really did bring it, bring it all to life. And it allowed you to see past this building, two batteries on stairs, there's a batteries on things like the guy just being in there. That's a batteries on stairs. That staircase goes up to there. It's now being used since since uh, 1684. There's another one on the other side, which I think is the one behind you. Um, and then that the staircase there that goes into the guard robe. Like again, the guard robe never been never been in you know, these places. And it's it's so well done that you don't actually feel as though the things um, overpowering and, you, and you, you're missing anything for the sake of the architecture. Um, and there we are as finished, um, light and airy. Um, there's the the, the, the massive. Um, well, the four the four pillars <laughs> and the, uh, the the concrete floor that the whole thing sits on. So the whole base it stands like a table. It basically rests slightly, bit so gently on, on everything else. Um, and of course, the roof um, you can get with the roof, and you can walk around, and you can basically have to shuffle anymore. You can actually walk on the roof. And then, to be fair, you do get a good view of York, but you also now get a good view of York. You can actually take your time and have a look at, and there's some proper interpretation of what you are looking at. Um, I will tell you one little uh, story about the uh, the guy from he's, he's left. So I'm going to tell you this now. Chap chap called Rob Campbell, <laughs> and um, he was an interpretation manager. And we we're going to do the interpretation for this building. It was going to be it was going to be great. And he's, we stood on top. This before, so obviously this was built. We stood on top, and he said, um, "I said, look, you know, it's not obviously a great tower. No, we can see what the castle was, you know, but we've got look at the view. It's, it's all right, isn't it? You mean it's not that much to look at?" You know, we've, we've been fighting a losing battle with you guys. Anyway, he left. He went, he went to New Zealand. I'm sure they deserve him. Um, and then <laughs> uh, we, we did it, the interpretation. We I had some part in this, but mostly it was Jeremy Ashby, my my, my boss, who was doing the uh, he the guidebook and that sort of thing. But the interpretation now will give you um, far more understanding of the of the castle, the way it lived from from the. Anglo-Danish times right way through to, to the 19th century, so you can understand when there's basically the sound post now, you can walk in these lobes and the, the sounds playing and there's voices. They have somebody reading reading out in just the, somebody speaking Norman French, which is not useful, and also somebody speaking Anglo-Danish, which is which is both I think I think I recognize two words before the thing. But anyway, it's it's nice. Um so there we that's that. And then exterior-wise, and there we are. And that's the view that you know, yeah, it's all right. Um but you can. <laughs> um, oh, the other thing was that we well, we did these two. Yeah, okay, it's about the last staircase. Um, there's a nice little timeline at the bottom there. We sort that out, and there's the view of the roof. And you can then basically you can't you can hardly see the roof from the ground level, so it was quite nice. But you can actually just saunter around there, take your take your back crisp, or, you know, a bottle of water there, or, or a drink, and sit and enjoy enjoy the sunshine. So um, I think that's the uh, the last slide. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you both to uh, Stephen and to to Mark there. Um, so we've got time for some questions for Stephen and Mark. Uh, Gary again. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Mark. Hello. Yeah, a couple of questions. Just first one, then the four timber columns sit on the concrete floor. Is it just the, the thickness of the floor and the reinforcement that yeah. holds that then? And then obviously all those loadings are transmitted down through the, right. the sort of bottom. Then the second one was just, you you referring to the chapel. Is that the gatehouse, basically? I yeah, didn't... It's called the floor building. 
Oh, right, so you, yeah. go in that, you go in the, in the, to the, the door there, the bottom, you see it there? If yeah. you go in that door, there was a portcullis. Yeah. You walk to the door, and then outside the other side of the door, there's, a, there's a, another, a staircase. You go into the tower itself, turn back, and there's a staircase that takes you up into that room above where the portcullis came up. Actually, yeah. strange. You know, the portcullis was housed in the in the chapel, which is an unusual thing. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so there's, a, there's a, a 13th century chapel on the first floor. Uh, was there any significance to that chapel, i.e. for royal usage or anything? I think this this castle was was designed as a, as a as a royal residence. I don't know if it was ever used as a royal residence. It, it turns out mostly it was used as a, as a chapel or a chancery and various other things. Um, when the king when the later kings came, he didn't stop certainly didn't stop in Clivers Tower. They didn't, they didn't stop in the castle. They stopped in somewhere else in Posh, like the Austin Friars or or with the bishop. Um, but yeah, it looks like the whole thing's at a sort of a, a design aesthetic. That makes it look like it should be used as a residence. I'm not quite sure it was, but yeah. But but having said that, most castles, most castle keeps, which is effectively like a keep, um, would have a a, a private oratory or a, a chapel in it. Any more questions, Gail? Hey, it's another Clifford's Tower question. Just on the previous slide, you had like a, there was a circular feature or something on the floor. Is that where the flagpole was? What is that? On the previous slide, which one? Uh, I think so. Yeah. No, the next one. Oh, this one. Yeah, down in that's the. A, oh, that's a well. Oh. Yeah. That's nice. A, yeah, that's a well. Should I mention that? But um, that was um, that was that was cleaned out. It was about. 800 pounds worth of 50 pence pieces down there but they were so rusty and clagged together couldn't have been with them they waited for scrap <laughs> uh, just another question for mark this might you might not know the answer to this but i'm just wondering what works like this do for visitor numbers did you was there a a noticeable uptake in in more visitors after this had happened and yeah. that kind of double the number or yeah I, i'm not a marketing person but i think there was Basically, the problem with Clippers Tower was that the, the Simon Thurley, God love him, said, um, this is hardly the place, it's the most visited site in Yorkshire. It's one of the most visited sites in the country for English heritage. Um, but people weren't getting, the, weren't getting the benefit of it. They were going to get a really dispiriting sort of visit. It was full of pigeons and it was, you know, it was quite rubbish. Um, so, yes, there, there would have been an uplift, there would probably be an uplift, but that really wasn't the main, the major preoccupation because... There's only a certain amount of people you can have in at any one time anywhere because of fire regulations. So you, you, you can't open the door and say, oh, come in, because you can't do it. You've got to stop them and then let people out and you know at some point. So um yes, it was it was it was very it was I think 120,000 visitors here, I think somewhere. But generally speaking, most of the visitors are, 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 are from other abroad, foreign countries. So also that was another thing that was a bit of a rip off because people you the matter it's like going to Venice. If you don't like them being in Venice, well tough. There's, there's, there's another three million people coming tomorrow, and it was a bit like the Clivers Tower. If you didn't, if you didn't like the price, you didn't like the you know you didn't like the view. Well, you're going you're going back home tomorrow. There'll be somebody else. So they, I think the whole thing was saying we're not really doing people a, a good service. That's what. So it wasn't about numbers. It's about providing something really good, and also then say look, isn't York great? You know, which you know which it is. <laughs> I think there's somebody at the back. Yeah, Susan. Hi. Oh, you want... <laughs> we sat down to you. Thank you. Hi. Um, don't know if you can hear me all right, but um, I've lived in York since the 1970s. I've never noticed graffiti on the walls before. Just before the COVID lockdowns, I noticed there was an awful lot of graffiti on an inside tower right near Bootham Bar. So I emailed the previous archaeology field officer, and I think it was all cleaned up. But, I mean, do you do regular checks of going around the walls to see if they're being vandalised? Yeah, I, I walk the walls once a week. Right. But obviously, we do rely on people telling us yeah. about new graffiti. Um, the council do have a graffiti officer that, that deals with any graffiti, and that's right across the hall the whole uh, area yeah so not just the walls but uh yeah we do try and keep on top of of any graffiti um yeah but there is somebody there yeah. uh, but but we have to rely on on people telling us um because it, it's it's such a big monument it's two miles long and 
and obviously there's there's three sides to it, isn't there, with the inner, outer, and and, and the walkway. So, um, so yes, we do we do monitor um, where we can, but we do rely on on people walking the walls and and letting us know. The only reason I mention it is that it happens to be right next to overlooking the beer garden at the Lion and Lamb. Now there's an awful lot of tree coverage there. So it's an obvious spot if a load of kids walking on the walls want to stand there and just sort of carve their names into the walls. Open. So, I mean, I was just wondering about whether it'd be worth putting up CCTV. Uh, Big Brother is here. Possibly. Um, there's obviously all, all sorts of issues with doing that and, and uh, requiring consent and cost of uprunning it, uh, you know, keeping it. it the fact of the matter is that the city walls is a, a free attraction and it, it's a lost leader almost for the for the city isn't it that it, it costs a lot to to maintain well um and doesn't doesn't charge and rightly so um i'm, I'm sure it, it helps the rest of the city um uh, you know in terms of the economies but it's something we can look into if we get any little spots along the walls um that we that we need to address um, there is some CCTV in Boovem um, bar itself. Um, if you when you walk, you can see in the corner is a CCTV. Well, this is what I was wondering. So I think your camera's looking out, haven't you? I mean, if you could put one looking down the side. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any further questions from the audience? Can I ask a question? Yeah, um, just for Mark with the mound. I, I mean, I mean, I've, I'm from York. I haven't lived here all my life, but a large part of it. I never knew about that perimeter wall at the bottom of the mound. Why would they go to, for something so substantial? Those photos you showed of the children and the height of the wall. Why would? Why do you think they would have gone to the effort to remove it if it was actually containing the structure? Do we know why it disappeared? No, the wall didn't disappear. The wall's still there. Oh, it's just buried under the grass. It's basically the, the oh. I'll go back. We've got five seconds to go back. Because I saw, so that's what the steps were that were when they took the, the turf off. Yeah. So, uh, um, one more there. So, if you look at this picture. So, it's still actually in situ. That's the steps. That's, oh, that's the prison. It's been knocked down apart right. from the prison and then piled up stepwise against. A wall. Oh, right. You take, you take, the, you take the stones away, then you're left with that. There's the stones that are taken away. That is the that's the wall. Oh, I misunderstood. Gosh, that's goodness. The, that's the wall there, and it's, it should have been about this height. It was a lot higher at the time, and it's also another meter and a half deeper than that as well. Wow, it's absolutely enormous thing, and it was beautifully. It's, it's it looks like they, I don't know, they they must have built it in situ, and then. It's, it's it's just ever so slightly curved because it goes right around the world. It's a beautiful thing, and all just it's all gone. So you know, still it's further around. It was, we didn't get that far. We would have done. There'll be the, the little gate that ran through the steps that ran up to let you into the into the tower. But yeah, so it's it's all still there. And it, in fact, that's what I think. It's what hold, it's holding the whole thing up. Judging yeah. by the by the when they were saying about the the the, the, the soil and the, the makeup of the soil that that um, it looks like the whole thing being contained by that the actual wall. Well, see, we had a big flood um, when, before we started this work. <coughs> oh, shit, what year it was now? Um, and the, the water just got to the base of the steps. Oh. <laughs> yeah, just just got to the base of the steps to get. We thought, oh, that's all right, isn't it? <laughs> Did we know it this wall? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I mean, it's on photographs and records and everything else, but yeah. But it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, we see it was still, I had a remarkable time with them, um, stood there when they were doing this work, um, explaining to, to, to tourists and people, and there's lots of people from York were saying they've never seen it. And I was kind of photographs, you know, these the historic photographs, so look, this is the wall. And a lot of people said, the one place you can actually see the, oh, sorry, I meant to mention, the one place you can actually see the prison is if you go to the car park behind Coppergate and go to the River Foss. And if you look at the floor, at the, at right on the edge of the river, that wall, the foundations of the wall are there. And it's, it's stones as big as this table. That's basically, I don't think these big buttresses that are on the, on the, on the, on the front there. Anyway, so I'm a bit your go. Any further questions? I think I'll get you to your five bit. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> all right, I can do it. Oh, well. um, 
Well, if there's no further questions, I just want to say thank you to all the speakers again. They've all been fantastic. And thank you all for turning up um, in person. And um, thank you to those watching at home online as well. And um, you can revisit any of the talks that we've had today. Um, you can see them on the YouTube channel, which is um, on the screen at the minute, City of York Council YouTube. Um, so you can watch all the talks again, if you'd like, or go back and revisit them. Apologies for a few technical hitches that we had this morning, um, especially for those online. I think we lost the sound for 10 minutes or so. Uh, but hopefully this afternoon we've sorted all of those out. And um, yeah, some some feedback. Those who are here in person will get um, a survey, a quick online survey sent out to them again. Um, um, for those online or anybody else, feel free to drop me an email um, at the address on the screen. And do check out the historic environment record, which has constantly been updated with all of the projects we've heard about um, today, all of the field work. Uh, so yeah, that, that's it. Thank you again. Thanks for coming. Thank you.